I say this. Good morning. Okay. Can you hear me okay? In the recording? Can you hear me? I think this one is much better, huh? Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here. So um, I am uh, the co-organizer, Xu Lu. I'm with the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, as well as Biomedical Engineering. Here is Professor Edison Tomas. Uh, he is with Electrical and Computer Engineering. So the two of us, um, on behalf of our wireless networking and communication group at UT Austin, would like to extend our warmest welcome to all of you for attending our Texas Wireless Summit 2019. The theme is connectivity and the sensing at the human-machine frontier. And um, because I have a class to teach soon, so I will let Edison take over the stage and uh, kickstart our event. All right, thank you, Nishu. We'll see you later today. Um, yes, welcome again. Uh, we have a very exciting program. Uh, this morning we have a great group of speakers. Um, and uh, so, you know, let's, let's just get started with the show. So last year here at the, at the Texas Wireless Summit, um, the, the theme was uh, AI and the mobile device. Um, and, you know, this year we are really uh, going beyond, uh, you know, traditional, the traditional mobile device and, and, and thinking more broadly about human-centered computing at this intersection of sensing communications. And in particular, we have some talks and panels uh, today that will provide some insights into how this, uh, you know, technological landscape can, can really drive advances uh, both in connectivity and also in, in how um, uh, connectivity can really enable new breakthrough experiences. Um, and so uh, we have, a, I think, a very exciting uh, program today prepared for you that will be um, highlighting all of these um, uh, areas. So what I would like to do is we, we have, as I said, uh, lots of talks and panels today. So I'd like to um, move relatively quickly here so that we can get started the, with, with the actual program. I would like to go through uh, the agenda a little bit just to give you a sense of what we have in store for today. Um, all right. So it's a little bit uh, small for you to see, but I saw that we have the agenda up there as well. So that's much better. So at a high level, we're going to have two themes that we're going to be talking about today. So the first one is wearables, and the second one is the space of virtual augmented mixed reality. And so for the most part, wearables uh, will be in the morning and in virtual reality um, in the afternoon. And we'll have several talks and also two panels on these uh, topics, along with a very special keynote uh, this morning. Uh, and then uh, in the afternoon, we're also going to have a, a research showcase where we'll uh, have some uh, WNCG faculty uh, talking about some of our own work in this, in this space. And in terms of uh, logistics for the event, uh, to provide you with the you know, energy for all of this and also the opportunity to, to do some networking, uh, we'll have uh, two, let me highlight here my slides. We're gonna have two 30 minute coffee breaks, uh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The morning will be at 10 and the afternoon will be at 3 p.m. And uh, during, during these uh, poster sessions, uh, sorry, during these coffee breaks, we're gonna have poster sessions as well. And the poster sessions are, are gonna be um, right here uh, on the outside of the, um, of the auditorium uh, at the very edge of, um, of the hallways. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, food and tables sort of in the middle and then the, the posters at the very end. So make sure that you check the posters. Um, and so this is going to be happening during the coffee breaks. And we're also going to have, uh, of course, our lunch break, which is going to be around 12.35. And, um, and then at the very end of the day, we're going to have a uh, reception at 5 o'clock. Um, a few other things about uh, where we are. So we are in the 
uh, EER building here, which is a fairly new facility in, on campus. Um, the bathrooms are just outside the door here. If you if you walk out of the auditorium, if you um, head to the to the left, the, the bathrooms are going to be right there. And one thing that I should say is that in order to keep this auditorium nice and clean, uh, only water uh, is allowed in here. So if you have uh, you know food and snacks during the break. Uh, please, uh, please make sure that you you enjoy it outside. Um, and also, please make sure that you mute your cell phones during the presentations. Um, and you know, if you could sit a little bit closer to the to the to the stage, just to to make it a little bit uh, more um, sort of cozier for the presenter and, and for everybody, that that would be nice as well. Um, let me see. One slide here about WNCG. So uh, the Texas Wireless Summit is organized by WNCG, right, which is a research center here at uh, UT Austin. And we are now 24 faculty from uh, the departments of electrical and computer engineering, aerospace, mathematics, and computer sciences. And, uh, you know, the, I would say one of the, the highlights of, of our research center is the interactions that we have with our affiliates. And here's a, um, a list of all of our current affiliates. Um, and uh, we are very excited to have all of you here today, or many of you here today for, for the event. Now, last but definitely not least, we would like to thank uh, these year's uh, sponsors for helping us produce this wonderful event. So, um, Norton Rose Fulbright, um, Holland and Knight, um, law firms, uh, RCR Wireless, uh, which is also uh, live streaming this event, so thank you. Uh, the IEEE Communication Society, the Central Texas chapter, and of course the University of Texas, the Cochrane School of Engineering, and also the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Excellent. So uh, this is what I wanted to cover here in the morning. So what I'm going to do next is um, get started with the day. So I'm going to be switching computers here really quickly. All right, and so I would like to um, get started today uh, by introducing our uh, first speaker, uh, Brian Modoff, um, who is currently Executive Vice President, Vice President at uh, uh, for Strategy and Mergers and Acquisitions for Qualcomm. He's, he's had this position since uh, 1995, and prior to joining Qualcomm, um, Sir Modoff was at Deutsche Bank. Uh, he got a, a BA in Economics from California State University. Um, and a Master's of International Management from the Turnberg School of Global Management. So, um, please welcome um, Mr. Modoff. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's see here. There you go. Good morning. How's everyone today? Good? We awake? All right. So actually, I've been uh, kicking this, uh, this uh, event off uh, with Jeff Andrews for, God, north of a decade now, uh, doing the, the first uh, presentation in the morning. I've been at Qualcomm now for four years. I run ventures as well for you startups out there. Uh, that's a third area of interest for us. We spend a lot of time uh, in the venture investment area. We invest about 125 to 150 million annually in our venture investments. Uh, we have a team of about 25 uh, people in the team or in the group. Uh, we invest in the U.S., uh, in China, in Israel, uh, and all other parts of the world. So we're very involved out there uh, in this market. So just uh, so you understand that. So what is Qualcomm? I'm sure a number of you know who Qualcomm is. Uh, you know, we spent the last 30 years uh, interconnecting people, and we're going to spend the next 30 years interconnecting their things. Uh, what Qualcomm is really good at is its core competency is uh, low power, high performance compute. Uh, they can connect to, and talk to any radio anywhere in the world. 
and then system design. We can make all of this work. So we're very good at those three areas. And what's interesting about how the world is evolving is that you know the technologies that we developed to, to deal with uh, people are now spreading with 5G into all these other markets. And our core competencies are very relevant to the changes that are about to occur. So we'll look at the, so that's slide one. Uh, this is my second slide. So what is 5G? You know, I think uh, you know, one thing people need to understand about 5G is the significance of it. You know, you know, some people say, well, what's really about 5G? The modulation scheme doesn't change, and that's been one of the things about the last previous Gs is you had a change in modulation scheme. Here, you really don't have that. But what you get is you get a series, kind of a tool belt of things that 5G brings to the table to create the superior communications network topology. And this is the first time we can say, the first time wireless is superior to wireline. We've always had a benefit in terms of cost, flexibility, ease of deployment, those things. But now we can compete with wireline in terms of latency and with bandwidth. Now it's not backhaul, this is access, but it's the superior network topology. And that creates a lot more use cases for 5G. So the real change in 5G is we go from uh, what you see here previously in you know, 4G, high-speed broadband, kind of some of the apps. This is where you know, Lyft and various things like that really uh, became prominent was during 4G because you had that, that ability to get that pretty quick reaction. But with 5G, you can see you get a massive expansion in the addressable market of things that we can do with 5G. Uh, why? Because the network architecture changes. When you look at it, you get a 10x decrease in end-to-end -end latency. You can get sub-millisecond latency. Uh, and we've been demoing this for a while. We actually, two years ago at Mobile World Congress, were demoing sub-millisecond latency, Ethernet quality latency uh, over wireless. So that's a key element right there. Second, uh, obviously higher experience throughput, much more bandwidth uh, to the user, gigabits of speed. You know, what, you know, I mean, I can get more bandwidth into my cell phone than I can get into my home modem. You know, that's a real big change in, in how the network architecture has evolved. Uh, spectrum efficiency goes up by three times. Uh, uh, higher, because of the network densification, one thing about wireless is in order to add capacity, you need to be able to densify. As we're going up in frequencies, obviously signals don't propagate as, as, as far. We're able to densify even more and create even higher aggregate system capacity in a given area. So, you know, that, that, those, that variety of spectrum really gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the amount of system capacity we can make available to an end user. Um, obviously, 100 times better network efficiency. This really applies to the cost. There's a significant drop in the cost per bit to deploy with 5G. Uh, and then uh, uh, 10x more connection density. We're talking about, you know, it's one of the big changes is the control plane architecture of wireless enables you to, to manage and control billions of devices across a network. And that's a significant change. And, you know, as you look at this hyper-connected internet of things, you're going to have that. You're going to have this, you know, significantly more dense networking. You have a lot more things controlled and managed via wireless. 5G enables that. So you can see there's a significant uh, change in the way the network uh, uh, evolves with 5G. And, and for us, we're seeing it in terms of our business. We just reported a, a solid quarter. Our stock is at a record high. It's never been this high. It's, it, was, it closed at 94 the other day. That's a record high for Qualcomm. You know, and this is a 30-year-old company, and we're hitting record highs. And I can tell you, as a former tech analyst, to have a company that's 30 years old hitting record highs, you don't see it very often. Like Microsoft may be another example, but there are very few companies that are, have, are this mature and people are seeing this kind of future for the company. Uh, we actually guided up Q1. We don't guide Q1 up, but we're seeing you know, 5G handsets coming into the market. We're seeing growth. We're starting to see, and going into 2020, we're starting to see this. And, and so you know, it's, it's affecting our business, and it's affecting our business in a very positive way. And, and so what does this mean? You're looking at, we estimate, $13.2 trillion in goods and services uh, by 2035. So 5G is going to have a pervasive uh, an impact on how society is constructed and how services are delivered. And, and when you look at our company, you know, we obviously have done very well in mobile. We're now... Uh,
$6.5 billion. Okay, it's working again. $6.5 billion uh, uh, we announced this quarter. That was up from, up from three and change a year ago. Test one, two, three. I'll talk about how light switches are going away. That will generalize a little bit. Okay, let me plug in. We still need, actually we don't need wires for this, but I always feel better with them. 
For now, we need the power cable, too. But we're good. So it's wonderful to be uh, uh, back in Austin. I always love it every time I come. And uh, it's just a, such a wonderful part of Texas, wonderful part of the world. And uh, great to be here at UT. I have so many colleagues that are here. Uh, it's great to see old friends. And uh, wonderful to see all of you guys. Uh, I'm going to go through a, a bunch of things, uh, examples from a lot of the work that, that my team's been doing in the Media Lab that really center on the idea how we connect to this network feature that was so well portrayed in the last talk. Actually, we treasured all of our close interaction with Qualcomm over the years. And uh, it's, uh, it really uh, is uh, an exciting time for all of us working in this area now. If you want any more detail, you can always reach out to me or uh, our website, is, as I mentioned, we have lots of papers and stuff like that there. So this is uh, going a little bit further ahead. Uh, I figured I'd start with my conclusions, more or less. I uh, don't know how long, how, if I'll be able to get to them in this talk. But uh, I just gave a 50-year anniversary keynote for the computer science department in uh, Linz, Austria. And uh, 50 years, I figured, okay, let's look 50 years ahead. You know, 50 years ago, we had the internet just starting, right? We had the PDP-11, uh, we had the moon landing. All exciting, but looking 50 years up, I was bold about that. I don't have that slide here. A lot of crazy stuff, a lot of fun stuff, but on the way, right? This is on the way. Uh, these are the things you have to deal with. I'm not going to talk about this in my talk, but I think this is crucial. Uh, social media is in a mob mentality. The people who invented the internet, for the most part, are lamenting their invention a little bit because of you know, the way it's not bringing people together, it's breaking them apart, bringing them together in clusters. We haven't yet gotten to what we like to call an MIT collective intelligence. It's really stillborn. It's got to kneel down. Uh, it's not where it's supposed to be. This is a real priority. Uh, certainly, those of us who do wearables will be part of this. It's going to involve lots of different disciplines, and it's crucial, and there are a lot of ideas coming out now. Let's hope that we, we fix it, because uh, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, speaking of which, and this is what a lot of my work speaks to, the interfaces to information become you know, wearable. We know that. That's why we're here. And also precognitive, right? We live in a world now where it's text, it's speech, it's images. Uh, a lot of this is going to start to happen very, very close to us, right? If it's a wearable or even an implantable, it'll go far enough ahead. Uh, but before we even get the idea, uh, we're going to start to, uh, uh, you know, anneal with, with, with our information and our devices. So it, it, it becomes a, a seamless extension of self. I'll talk a bit about that. In a way, our brains are moving outside of our skulls. Uh, and at this point, reality has changed with a, a phone at arm's length. I was talking about that in the abstract, and you know, it had a, certainly a big effect just through stories that people tell. What about when we all see a different reality? In the afternoon, there'll be talks on augmented reality. I'll talk a little bit about some VR stuff we're doing here. Uh, but yeah, when we have everywhere augmented reality, people will see a different reality physically, not just read about it. So uh, this is going to be another quantum leap. We've got to fix it now. Um, the battle fought over our attention online, right? This value, monetary value in our attention. And online, there's always this, these sinkholes to try to grab it and divert it. This is going to be fought out in the real world. When we have augmented reality, when things are cognizant of where we are, uh, displays can morph in different ways. Um, you know, the real world will fight to, to distract our attention too. So this is something that we really have to be able to control. My students start to think about this a lot. We think about a lot of ways of measuring attention, too. Uh, and of course, this goes further. Where does self stop and other begin? Our do with social media, younger people are making collective decisions. It's not as if you know, they, they, they come up with all their decisions themselves. They work more in groups. We see it in the students at, at, at MIT. I see it in my own children. Uh, and this is just one thing that is happening. Uh, with, with the technologies we're developing, but if it goes further, the whole idea of, of, of individual identity starts to blur. You know, am I me, am I a collective? Uh, especially when this connection becomes more intimate. And uh, in the end of the talk, I'll talk a bit about work we're doing about how human presence generalizes. When we have sensors all over the world, uh, how do we actually bring that information to human perception and begin to play with the here and now, the whole concept of you know, where you are at a given time. So it's, it's exciting, it's provocative, it's alarming, it has all of these. It's a great time to be here, because we're going to see such change in the next 50 years. And we're in the middle of it in this community. So topics. I'll start with a bit about me, uh, and then I'll talk about wearables. I don't know if it's time to talk about the cognitive audio work we're doing. I got that at the end, if there is. Uh, smart buildings, uh, work on sensitive materials, and again, generalization of presence. Um, the talk is going to range in scale. 
from wearables to uh, buildings to uh, landscapes and to space and oceans. I've got very little time. I think I'll maybe talk a little bit about one of the space projects, but we have a space initiative at the Media Lab. As I mentioned, I worked at Draper Lab for a decade doing a lot of spacecraft control and working with the space community. So for me, it's kind of a, a coming, back, coming home moment uh, to work in space again. But it's a great time for that, too, because what's happening in space is all being redefined. And wireless is, is you know, a different kind of a concept there. We start talking about groups of spacecraft, collective control, it's a little bit like what we're doing in our homes and offices, but we're doing it at a different scale. Uh, this is my team. Uh, I, we, groups in the lab have grown a bit since Edison's day, so in my group I have probably on the order of 20 people if you add up the visitors and, and the students that come from all over the world. Uh, this is all of us at a, at a dinner. It's a great group. Uh, they tend to be uh, uh, you know, great technologists, great engineers, uh, great scientists, but also uh, they tend to be artists or musicians in my team, too. And the Media Lab, this is not unusual. We like to see this hybrid. And uh, this is something that my colleague Neri Oxman drew to kind of describe what the lab wants to be about. And uh, it's called the Krebs Cycle. And it's, again, a, a whole convective uh, journey from science into engineering, from design into art, and then ultimately you you do cross some of these boundaries, too, from design and engineering, maybe from science to art as well. Um, and we love to live in more or less in the center here. My group is kind of an engineering group, so we're here, but you know, the art presence is, is not at all, at all ignored, as you'll see. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about me. I grew up doing sensors. Uh, they've always been important to me. This is when I won the science fair in the ninth grade. Uh, so yeah, I'm continuing on in that tradition, I guess, in this, this modern age. But as Edison mentioned, I also love music. I'm totally obsessed by it. As a matter of fact, I deeply regret I didn't come to Austin a few days earlier to go to the Levitation Festival. It's one of the great psychedelic music festivals that's happening here in Austin. And I went one year, it was incredible. So uh, maybe next time I come, we can time it a bit better. Um, and uh, of course, you know, I was the technical kid. And these were my favorite books uh, when you know, I started to read when I was in grammar school. Uh, Tom Swift, some of you may know uh, who he is. If you come from the US, you would. Uh, he's the boy inventor, right? Very sexist in those days, unfortunately. Now it would be as well, the girl inventor doesn't matter. Uh, but he would invent all these uh, really wonderful contraptions with crazy science. And of course, there'd be bad guys, be an adventure, something like that. Uh, but I really got to love the old ones. Uh, the old Tom Swift series were written at the turn of the century. It's a world that's gone now. So it's a world of uh, Zeppelins and dirigibles. It's a world of uh, Tesla coils and Marconi-style wireless. Uh, you don't have an industrial R&D lab like you would have in the newer series. This is more or less contemporary with Edison. It's something growing out of her barn in the countryside. So it's uh, just an incredible uh, cyber uh, steampunk uh, series of novels. And the, the, just the whole feeling of that world that was gone just attracted me. Maybe people would feel that with this now. So yeah, I did my PhD in high energy physics, <laughs> working with Sam Ting's group at MIT shortly after they won the Nobel Prize in 76. This is uh, me here in the, uh, the, the Petra E plus E minus uh, collider at Daisy in Hamburg. It's the German synchrotron facility. Its accelerator is no longer there. But uh, I still love physics, still collaborate. Um, but of course, the music didn't go away. And when I was a kid, I was very pulled to these devices. Um, these are patchable modular synthesizers. I don't know if I have to necessarily introduce them like I used to because they, come, they came back. People like these again. Um, you know, it's essentially every module has a set of functions. You patch them with wires like an old analog computer. You make a process. So uh, people go on tour. That's Keith Emerson. He tore with these things. And then eventually digital synthesis did them away. But they're coming back now. But as a kid, this is what I, I, I heard in music. I heard these sounds. I wanted one of these. I couldn't afford to buy it. So I decided to build my own. Uh, this is in my parents' basement when I was an undergraduate, I was building my first synthesizer cabinet. This is the linear integrated circuit manual from uh, National Semiconductor. It was small. <laughs> it was a different world. Uh, a lot of old op amps which have since replaced. Um, and then I postdoc in Zurich after that. I, got, you know, I did my PhD, I was kind of busy, and then it was in Zurich. And in Zurich, I mean, it's a wonderful place. ETH is a fantastic university, but in those days, you know, it was difficult to really break out into Swiss society. So I worked like heck like I do at MIT for a year. I got ahead of my work. I needed something else to do. So I started building synthesizer modules. 
I had a lot of crazy ideas left over, and there were chips that could make noise in different ways. At that point in the early 80s, I could have built a microprocessor controlled wave engine, digital synthesizer, but it would have been very impoverished, it would have been very limited, it would have been obsolete by the time I finished it. On the other hand, I built a module out of a voice synthesizer chip, for example, I still use it now, still works, still relevant, uh, doesn't go obsolete, and you can use it as soon as you finish it, you don't have to wait till everything is done. So I built about 80 modules. And then that was my living room uh, back when I moved back to the USA. So uh, all of the synthesizers, the Moog, for instance, has got a huge cable harness that's, that's, that's going to this. Everything is completely interoperable. It's uh, just a continuous system, all controlled by patching. So this is uh, at the MIT Museum in 2012. They invited me to do an installation with it. And I did a whole bunch of different pieces. And I'm not playing the keyboards here. This is sound from one of them. There are many more of them. You can hear all of these the stuff at sit.media.mat.edu. It's just a patch that is made a state machine that makes music. And since there's so many modules, there's a lot of sonic variety. Uh, this is the logic area here. You can see where all the wires come together. And this is a wireless symposium. It's my only show that's heavy on wires. Uh, but again, the whole idea of patching, your hands are on the medium that's controlling the sound. It's a very different experience. If you're dealing with digital synthesis, you're behind menus, you're abstracted away. There's something special about this, and people realize that there are more companies making modular synthesizers now than in the heyday in the early 70s, late 60s. Um, so I got invited to uh, do an installation for uh, the Center for Advanced Visual, Study, Visual Studies, the 50th anniversary, one of the first places in the world that really incorporated uh, the uh, projects that go between art and science and art and engineering at MIT. Uh, they were having their 50th anniversary, so they invited me to uh, do an installation in the uh, Plasma Fusion Center at MIT in the Alcator Tokamak control room. So I used even more patch cords, made even a bigger patch, and I used plasma data. So this is, uh, yeah, I'm a physicist, so I asked them to give me data. And it just looked wonderful. You can use some of these as envelopes. They've got interesting structure to modulate the sound. Or just play them as audio. This is what you hear. You put them into an audio band, play it back. It's intriguing. There's some almost an organic structure to this. It's maybe like a snake. I mean, it's got interesting uh, images that come to mind. So I just built a patch that was full of those. And again, I've got video and audio posted off the site. Uh, it would take those sounds. It would take sounds that come from the synth and it would just go on forever, right? This patch didn't, never stops, the music keeps generating itself through the, the, the logic and the patch. And it's streamed worldwide, so we streamed it live. As, as I do more pieces too, they all stream live over the net for weeks or months. So people all over the world can listen, in some cases even control the patch. Uh, this led to uh, a whole bunch of work I did at the Media Lab on musical controllers. So all kinds of different interfaces to control music in different ways. I'll talk about a couple of them because they were early wireless things. Uh, this is actually the first wireless project that I ever did in my group. It was 1997, set of shoes for a dancer, and uh, I had a whole bunch of sensors to measure all kinds of different ways you can move the, the foot, and I had a wireless connection from each shoe. So different fingers here on each foot. There was no Bluetooth, there was no uh, uh, Zigbee. We had to do the protocol ourselves, uh, but it worked, right? This is the data from somebody walking and the twisting and jumping and stuff like that. Um, this is the original card from 1997. This is a pick. I don't know if any of you remember this. 64 bytes of, of, of RAM, I think, in there. Um, UV erasable. This is uh, the gyro. You didn't get MEMS gyros back then. Draper made one, but you couldn't really buy one. This is the magnetometer. It's a Boy Scout compass with a rotor being sensed. Uh, this is the radio. It's a radio metrics radio I just got off the circuit seller. Uh, again, 433 and, and uh, what was it, 819 megahertz. Illegal frequencies in the US, I just streamed from them and they worked. That was always the key back then, right? Using the legal frequency, no one else was there, it'll probably work. Uh, now we live in a world of channel sharing, it's a different world. Can't do that. You don't have to. So this is a video from then, from 1998. This is a dancer that we worked with. So quacks come from the, the pressure sensors. He's hearing this in real time. It's a dual bass that makes the music. When he jumps, he has accelerometers. When he bends, everything goes up an octave. So this stuff is flute, we know that. We can change the music. And if he spins, we get it in the ray gyro. And 
then we had a capacitive sensor. Oh, yeah, sonar. So we arranged them with the sonar. It's essentially in every vehicle on the road now. We have it in our shoes in 1998. And uh, then we had an electric field transmitter. So we can, whoops, you can capacitively sense this height above a plate. That's what you're seeing, but not seeing it. Uh, Nike were sponsors then. We showed it to Nike. They were intrigued by it, but it was expensive. It was too far ahead. It was way ahead of the iPad, iPod. There was no iPod there. But it was in their mind, right? Ray Riley and the guys would come and see this. And that they, they acknowledge now is one of the main inspirations for the Nike Plus, where you control your music from, from the shoe, much later. Uh, but anyway, back then, we did the music piece. Uh, I would show this at conferences, at wearable conferences. Doctor would, doctors would come, want to collaborate. So we were at the, the gate lab at the Mass General Hospital, where you'd have to have a motion tracking apparatus on. They used active trackers in those days. Uh, so we built a stackable sensor architecture where we could put different sensor boards together on a stack with a wireless layer, and uh, we did channel sharing between uh, two feet at that time. So you could basically put on sensors a doctor would want to see and then analyze your gate. But that caused us to meet, uh, well, actually after that I wanted to go back to dance, and I wanted to make a, uh, a, a sensor that would put on the arms and legs of a whole dance ensemble. So uh, we used the Nordic radios at that time. We were able to get uh, uh, order a megabit a second out of it. And uh, we, we could do uh, uh, full uh, updates at 100 hertz from about 20 or 30 nodes, 25 nodes. And again, we looked at correlated activity, because you can't map on, on just all that data. There's way too much. You can't use a rule base. So this is one feature that we looked at, which was correlation between the dancers. Are they you know, tightly choreographed? Are they starting to slip out? Uh, we looked at the amount of energy, who was leading, who was following, things like this. But we were distracted. Again, through our gate analysis collaborators, we met the doctors for the Boston Red Sox, uh, and now the Patriots. Uh, and uh, they invited us to go to spring training and try our system out. So we put very wide range uh, gyros, wide range accelerometers on players. Uh, we went through a few iterations. That's the last one that we built specifically for, for sports. It was probably the first, uh, one of the first, not the first, super wide range trackers for athletics. We did this again around 2006. Uh, and uh, you know, we were putting the sensors on the player and then we can get them pitching and throwing and look at data, how a player, the player's data changes over time. Stuff that you start seeing in commercial products now that we were doing back then. Uh, one of my students did a spin-off kind of based on this. Uh, we have a, 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 a startup fund at the Media Lab that we call the E14 fund where uh, students can, can get a runway to develop things a little bit further past their theses. And Nanway uh, has very successfully built a small company around this uh, called Figure 8, where she's got a wide range IMU here for capturing motion, but she also has a goniometer uh, with flexible uh, fabric. She, did, she was the technical lead for Google Jacquard. She learned all about fabric. And then she, uh, and stretchy sensors, and she built one of these into this. And uh, now she's, um, working with uh, sports teams, with companies for looking at uh, physical therapy and, and health of workers and things like that. Of course, I had to wear them on a zero-gravity flight. As I mentioned, we have a space initiative at the Media Lab, and every year we can take projects on a zero-g flight, so I put them on my arms and legs. Because, you know, uh, accelerometers just don't work very well for measuring tilt and zero-gravity, and the rate gyros can drift, the magnetometer doesn't work as the vehicle is, is turning, uh, but these work beautifully. Uh, you can actually get uh, tantric levitation beautifully in a zero-gravity flight. So uh, I did my yoga levitation there. Um, but here's the data. Um, zero-gravity, the accelerometers see, see nothing, right? That's zero-g. This hypergravity down here, here's zero-g. Uh, but the goniometer, of course, works. We had an aero-astro group that were doing accelerometers and gyros, but they, they're, they're still working on their data. This is, this is all here. Uh, this is something that we did uh, in 2002. At that time, it was the world's lowest cost wireless sensor, probably, that lasted the longest time. Uh, you can make these for pennies. So it had an accelerometer. It was just a piece of piezo foil with a, with a weight on it, proof mass weight, it's just a CMOS timer, right? You buy this garden variety CMOS. Uh, it takes no power, only when it transitions. So this essentially, when, when it sees a, a pulse from the accelerometer, it powers up the timer for a 50 microsecond pulse. This is a dead man here, so it doesn't keep multi-cycling. And a single, transmit, single transistor RF transmitter, 300 megahertz. So you just hit this, and uh, it, it gives a pulse. A little wireless transducer. It's got the piezo electric sensor on the back, and all it does is measure. So of course, we used it to drive a music engine. 
uh, for large groups. This is Mark Feldmeyer by himself, but uh, we would give this to a group of 50 people and then try to coordinate the music based on what the group is doing. You can see he's got a tempo tracking algorithm, he adds more tracks as he sees more activity, and uh, he stopped the whole thing. These sensors lasted about a dozen years. They died just some years ago and uh, cost nothing to produce. Um, of course, wearable computing is very big at the Media Lab. Uh, some of the pioneers of wearables, some of you know some of these characters. There's uh, Thad Starner, uh, architect of Google Glass, and Steve Mann, uh, one of the pioneers of everywhere augmented reality, and lots of interesting people in between. Um, they would live the dream back then, right? They had their wearable, uh, they had a, at that point a laptop or a PC-104 rig in their backpack and wander around campus with it. Um, and of course, we thought a lot about wearables. Uh, in my case, it was interesting how to control the wearable, right? At some point, we'll all have them. I believe that. A lot of us that are here probably believe that, too. Um, there's a lot of work controlling wearables with cameras in, in the space up in front. Uh, but I think yeah, that leads to gorilla arm, other things. You've been in a crowded subway, you don't want to do this. Uh, I think you're going to control the wearable with your hands down by your side. So my group has thought a lot about ways to control uh, things uh, through fingers from the wrist. So we have many, many projects. Uh, this is something that has an IMU and an ultra-wideband positioning system. Actually, we're going to be using the Qualcomm peanut, but unfortunately, it was deleted, so I had to use a Ubisense. But again, you could know where you are within centimeters and point at things. Uh, cameras, looking down the wrist. A lot of people have done things like that, um, again, using machine learning. Uh, rings that are passive, powered up by uh, uh, an antenna. Uh, and I'll talk about these two in a second. So this is the wrist flex. Uh, this is uh, uh, looking at the pressure map on the wrist of the tendons. When you push your fingers, the tendons move. So we have a force sensitive resistor band, runs at very low power, it's wireless. You do machine learning, you can basically define what you're pinching, when you're pinching, use that for control. Uh, of course, you can train it to recognize what you're picking up. And uh, this is for a Kai paper, so we had to control. Oh, this is a low power wake up. Very, very low power, you can detect this gesture very reliably, just with sparse sampling. You know, we did the Kai paper, had to control something, controlled lights. We do a lot of lighting control in the group. This is uh, something that just went work for free. So you, you pull the brakes and uh, you flash the emergency lights. Um, this is uh, work that Artem did after that, my student Artem with Cindy Cow and Chris Schmantz group. Uh, fake fingernails, uh, which are full-up touchpads, Bluetooth touchpads, right? So the radio is so small now, you're just embedded here, lasts for several hours, continuous use, with a battery even this size, uh, and the capacitive sensing takes no power, it just works. So this is uh, the just rough map. So now you can actually hold something in your hand while you use it, right? You don't have to touch a screen, just with one finger you can, you can swipe. This is centroiding, it gets, gets a lot more accurate. In their video, they've got lots of application scenarios. Um, if something is worrying you, usually it's not good. <laughs> in the natural world, this is a, a mode that's exploited quite a bit, right? That's how insects can move and sometimes even get energy off of you uh, through, uh, you know, using your blood. Uh, that's a little bit difficult to do with electronics right now. Uh, but this inspired me to think about actually harnessing mobility, right? People think about energy harvesting, energy harvesting for a mobile system. Sure, if you're a robot, you have a lot of light, you can put on a solar panel, like they do on Mars, you get energy and you wait about a while, you limit how much you do. Uh, but what about just harvesting mobility? Because we live in a world where things are moving all the time. So you can hop onto a vehicle, hop onto a moving agent, attach and detach somewhere else. You know, nature does this all the time. Let's build electronics to do it. So we built uh, two versions. That's the kind of the flea versions. So that would sense proximity of a user, and it would attach. And then here it's programmed to see light. When it sees light, it can detach. Very simple grappling mechanism. Uh, still a proof of concept, but that could almost hook onto a vehicle. With a little bit more refinement, you could start getting away with it. Uh, this, this one over here is looking at the burr. So that's a wireless sensor that will attach to the last thing that sticks to it. So that, in that case, it's your shirt. So just like you go in the forest, you're moving seeds, now we're moving electronics. And then it, it goes back to the chair. But it was actually active. We had a pager motor inside, as well as the sensors and the radio. So uh, it could decide to detach. In this case, it's detaching at light. It sees light, it'll vibrate and just fall off. This led to uh, what my student Artem called dynamic wearable technology. He developed with his collaborators a whole bunch of little micro robots that could crawl on fabric. 
So these are wearables that can go where they want to be. Uh, so here's this little micro robot. And of course, all these things have Bluetooth connectivity, so on and so forth, wireless system. Uh, let's get the IMUs, now they go to where they want to do motion tracking. This is a display, it goes to where a display might be useful. It needs more pixels, so it finds a neighbor. It's poking for some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> this is Sean's stuff. Here's Cindy's work, it's dynamic jewelry. Uh, but then she also thought about telephones. You get a call, the microphone moves to where it's best located. Incoming call. And he you know, did a lot of work locating them and stuff like that. Uh, this is our time stuff he did for his PhD. He did robots that can crawl on the body. I talked, I didn't know what these things that crawl on the clothes are really good for in the end, but I thought uh, it'd be great to think about robots that could actually crawl on the body uh, for medical purposes. So he built what he called skin bots. They have pneumatic actuators and they can carry payloads like cameras and simple measurements. He does lots of electrodermal measurements on them. Uh, and, uh, and they crawl. They navigate through tattoos that you put down. And at the end, he uh, built uh, a set of them that could even adhere without the tether. So again, to think about a class of robots, if you don't have a gantry robot, you live in a future where these little robots can start to do useful medical things, uh, how do they navigate across the body and, and how do they work? So we try to make a stab at that here. Here he's uh, making skin measurements. It's one thing you can do with this, right? It can poke you. So it holds on with the suction cups, it pushes in, and it basically has a durometer. So you can make a map of the skin's properties. So all of us have our, our skin analyzed with these robots. Shiatsu, I guess. Um, this is the world that we're living in. I think uh, the previous talk uh, described this quite well. This is a slide I've had in my deck now for over a decade, maybe a dozen years. Um, you know, sensors are in everything that follow corollaries of Moore's law. They want to talk back. They talk back already. Uh, you need protocols that can talk across devices to share all this information. Um, we developed one a few years ago called Chain. Now uh, there are many protocols that exist that can start to do that. Many of you are actually developing them at, at different companies. So we're at the point now where the identity of a device starts to melt, right? They can start to be cross-functional. They're still siloed with different companies at some point. That will start to melt. And once we get security taken away so you own your data, it doesn't matter who hosts it in some sense. Uh, we live in this world now, right? Nick Arpant used to call it the digital butler. Uh, we talk to our devices. Uh, so we call Alexa, Google, uh, Siri, so on and so forth. Uh, we talk to this world. But this is temporary. Uh, we're talking to them for things we shouldn't have to talk to them about. You know, I'm tired of talking to these things. Uh, it should be a point where they become an extension of self, where these environments that we live in anticipate what we, uh, what we want and, and just do it. Because they build models of us, they know us better than we do. Um, this is the first project we did in this space. This is a turn of the last decade, around 2009, 2010. It was a wristband that measured activity for very, very low power. We used the analog accelerometer, so we did it for microamperes. It would last for, for months or a year, just with a little battery. Uh, it would give one-minute updates when you were in a room that had a, a radio network that would talk to it. Um, and it would measure temperature and humidity where you were, uh, light levels, things like that. And then critically, you could label it if you were cold or hot. So we used it to control the HVAC. So instead of controlling the HVAC from a thermostat, which is an abstraction, we, we measure it physically right on the body, and then we infer comfort. So everybody had a curve like this. This is, for instance, enthalpy space, temperature, and humidity. Here's people who are labeling the data as too cold, here too hot. So everybody gets a personalized curve. In this case, just a linear classifier could, could separate them. In the end, we use nearest neighbor. So simple classifiers to separate the states. And you can do it in multiple dimensions, activity, so on and so forth. And uh, indeed, uh, we use less energy. So there's some promise to this whole personalized thing. Uh, and uh, people felt more comfortable. So uh, you know, this could be a future of mobile age back when we have fine grain control. We're doing a lot of work still in, in the area of lighting. Uh, lighting control is broken at this point, right? This is the light panel for our building put up, what, eight, nine years ago. Uh, this button, I think, turns the lights off. I have no idea what these do. I, I don't know how to turn the lights on. In, in our space. Nobody really does. It's almost like a switch box metaphor. You store presets and somehow they appear on these. And this is in the wrong place, right? It's in a corner. Um, 
so we built a few different ways to control lights. This is a wireless puck that we built. They could look at the modulation from different solid state lights, and the modulations are different, so it can separate out the amount of light that comes from different lighting fixtures. And that sets up as a simple linear program to optimize. You put it there, you minimize the energy, you maximize the light going to here, you can adjust the overall intensity and run it as an upper bound. Uh, and uh, this is your light switch everywhere, just this little puck that can identify what light comes from what fixture. Uh, of course, you can always wear the sensor and look at reflected light. And this is Nan Zhao, one of my main lighting students over the years, uh, wearing a camera already uh, in the, the early 2010s. Uh, this is Nan wearing Google Glass, right, that has sensors. Uh, it has light sensors. It has uh, IMUs and knows where you look, uh, other sensors in it. So why not use those? So we did. And here, here's Nan with glass. Uh, and that's controlling the lights. This is the control that it's making in a matrix of, of lighting that we've worked out. And she, it's adjusting the intensity to give the con a constant illumination back into her eyes. No light switch. As she's moving, it's adjusting the lights dynamically to suit the task. But it's context sensitive. She's on the phone, it knows that through the sensors, and uh, it goes into a casual mode, better for social interaction. Uh, she goes back to work, it, it fades back into, uh, into its, its work mode, she has a visitor come, and it can automatically go uh, into uh, casual mode again. Yeah, my students were all musicians back then. We had a great band in the group. It was a great time. Uh, but going beyond that, why not bring uh, the essence of a space, another space, into the room? Not just change the lighting, but change also the, the space. So you, we're going to a world that has ubiquitous large uh, video surfaces. Uh, we brought that into the room here through projection at this point. We've also worked with AKTVs and other things. Uh, so we changed the lighting and the, uh, the video together. And of course, you can just talk to this through a, a Alexa interface or something and tell it what kind of scene you want. Uh, but even better yet, it would figure it out itself because we had wearable wireless sensors that the subjects are, are warm with. This is uh, Ross Picard's watch that looks at uh, electrodermal activity, uh, just, just skin resistance and other things. We had a heart rate variability analysis, and we had a camera looking at the, at the user's gaze and, and, and facial features. So with a set of these features, we could already server the room. So this is a video that started out as being a conceptual video. So somebody has a lot of time in their hands uh, in an office. Now he gets some work. So he panics a bit. The sensors kind of detect that. He gets more work. He panics even more. So uh, the system detects that and brings him into the woodland scene, which for him is restorative. So he calms down, detects that ideally, and uh, he gets back to work. It brings him to a state that's better for flow. So it goes always to the neutral to avoid jarring uh, any, anybody, and then it goes into the library, which for him was, was the state that worked best. So there we could just pull the features out of the sensors. That was pretty reliable. We could change, of course, the settings and the scene. Here we close the loop. So this is really a closed loop thing. This is where we want to be, highly restored, highly focused. That's where she is now. That's what we, uh, we detect. That's reweighting the scene that's up. It's not doing that well. So we pick another scene. Uh, that's more promising, that's working better, it's converging. So you have a closed loop control, so the, hu the, the, the viewer's affect is servo to be in a zone that you want. So uh, we've had a whole bunch of versions of this. We have a small, a portable version, working with Steelcase, one of our sponsors. Uh, here we can even uh, put out sense. We also have thermal cameras too, so we can look at the temperature difference between the nose and the forehead, which relates to cognitive load to some extent. So we have other ways of detecting uh, the user. And again, we can move that everywhere. Uh, this is a set of glasses that my team is building now. They're really interested in looking at focus and attention and measuring it uh, with a simple wearable. And uh, you know, uh, we're going to be wearing glasses for augmented reality at some point. Rather than just give display to the user, also look in and try to get some idea of, of their cognitive state. And I think there's a huge feature to this as well. So we made a few steps here. Uh, we're going to be building, ideally, some 60 or 70 of these, use them in some of the large events that we have. They measure the temperature at different points to get some idea of kind of load differences between the nose and other parts of the head. Uh, we can look at eye activity through some sensors that are here. We can track your gaze direction with an IMU. We can even locate them to within centimeters with an optical system that this interface is into. 
And uh, you know, the students want to do events, right? Creative events, we see how distracted or how focused the, the audience is. Uh, but also uh, learning, but not learning in a classroom like this, making everybody focus. If you're not focused, the teacher you know, wraps on your desk or digitally wraps on your, your wearable somehow. Uh, but more through uh, an online system, right? If you're, in the future, you're going to be able to learn everywhere you go because you're going to be plugged into this content all the time. So why not have the content look at your effect effective state, know that, and adjust how it, it actually responds to you, how it gives you information dynamically. So we're going to be using systems like this for uh, adaptive online learning. Right? Again, adjusting the content for the perceived effective state of the user. We do a lot of work in my group with uh, Sensate Materials, Sensor Networks, uh, physically on a substrate. This is something called Sensor Tape. That's one of Artem's projects. So it's a sensor network that's on a, something like a tape. And uh, you attach it. It could be wireless. Here we just attach it at one end. And uh, we've got IMUs everywhere. So it, uh, it measures its deformation, denotes confirmation. We have uh, proximity sensors, so you can make you know, screens or things to know how far away people are, capture geometries. Um, and Artem, of course, had trouble with his uh, posture, so uh, he made a posture sensor. People seem to like this. Sensors is utility, sensors is tape. It's a concept that resonates. I get every month somebody wants to use it for something. Uh, and we set up, at first, to make a wireless version. We could print the sensors. Uh, you can print you know, these rough ideas of what the sensors are. Wirelessly interrogate it so it can solve power with something like NFC and then tell you what it sees. Already for materials like drywall and building materials, if you have a leak, right, you never know. You can just put some of this in the back and interrogate it. It's easy to do. This is one of our collaborators doing that kind of thing, powering up with TV, uh, TV signals. He built a system for uh, measuring soil parameters. It's a whole other talk. Uh, one of my students did a wireless keyboard. I don't know if I have much time. I'll go through this very quick. Uh, is a scarf, totally in fabric. So it measures many modes. I mean, fabric can do lots of things. So I wanted him to capture a lot of it in the project. So here he's measuring proximity, his capacitive sensing. And he can couple them to other control surfaces. Couple from a key into the surface. Ribbon controllers, which is also fabric, you just snap it on the snaps. This coupling uh, EMI from a light into the key. So just the 60 hertz hum from the light, you can pick it up and couple that in. Pressure, that's easy to do in fabric now. And then uh, stress. This is something you can't really do in a keyboard, but this one does it. And he went on to stitch fabrics in different ways. This is a, uh, a loom. This is, we do this in Shenzhen. We have a media lab program in China where uh, students learn how to manufacture. So he learned all about the textile industry. He put in Sensei textiles and he just attaches it and now he can measure stretch or pressure physically in the, the fabric matrix. Uh, I've got another student actually weaving piezo fibers into space fabrics, right? You cover spacecraft and fabrics, you cover astronauts and fabrics. Why not weave some piezo electric fibers in there? We're working with the Old Things Lab uh, to actually develop some that will work for this. And uh, she's shooting high velocity projectiles into it, and she's working now on weaving it into the, the fabrics, testing it on the space station. This is the last part. I'm going to fly through it. A lot of work that we're doing now is about the opposite side of that, looking at perception, trying to uh, augment perception with sensors everywhere. Um, so this is our building, it's full of sensors. What if you could actually look through uh, the real glass with your, your augmented reality eyes? You could then see all the sensors. This is the HVAC system, Red, orange is too hot, blue is cold. Uh, this is uh, not meeting the set point. This is temperature humidity. And uh, this is just a video, uh, already in 2012. This is before Digital Twin, before people really were doing this. We had all the sensors feeding in real time from our building. Um, so here we're flowing through the atrium. We can see again the temperature. We had nodes out there. See the humidity, just move around virtually in the game. And uh, now we see people moving around. People had RFID if they were a badge, and we can see them as they go by uh, the reader. This is looking at activity for motion sensors. And of course, we have microphones everywhere uh, out in the public area. And uh, if you go near a microphone in the virtual space, you can hear the microphone in the real space. 
but we distort it. We don't want to snoop. So, yeah, we're, we're listening to them. You can hear if they're laughing, hear if they're excited. Can't understand a word they say. And again, people moving around. We can have the whole day pass in seconds. You really play with space and time fluidly. But especially with the voice, this got me thinking about presence, right? It was a feeling of like being in a weird dream uh, when you can start to almost hear people. So, uh, you know, what can we do to go further? This is the whole day just passing in seconds. So the atrium, the system goes out of setback, HVAC works, the atrium dries out, and people start coming in. Uh, yeah, the planet's being wired. Can we plug that into these environments? So uh, in the news a couple of years ago, there's this article about a cranberry bog that has turned into a wetland. That was co-owned by Gloriana Davenport, one of our founding faculty and now a close collaborator. Uh, she invited us to put sensors all over this former cranberry farm. You know, it's no longer economical to grow cranberries in the Northeast. Um, it's in Plymouth, so it's just south of Boston. They basically opened up stream beds, they bulldozed it, and they reset the environment to look like this. That was the Massachusetts Restoration uh, Environmental Commission. Uh, a couple of years later, nature caught, caught up, looked like that. So to monitor this process, we built wireless sensors, and we were really thinking about how we connect that to people. So uh, that's our sensor. I'll talk a bit more about it. It's got you know, motion sensor to look at macrofauna like coyotes and deers. It's got light analysis. It's got temperature humidity on each one. Uh, it's got a uh, microphone to do uh, analysis of audio features. We can plug sensors in to extend it. Uh, microphones all over the place that are wired. We're going to go wireless now. But we want synchronization because we're looking at localizations, very tight synchronization on them. Cameras, too. So uh, wireless network back to a head end, wire, low power wireless. It's a, our own variant of Zigbee around the site. That's our sensor board designed by Brian Maiden, who's finishing his PhD in my team now. So again, it's a real environmental sensor workhorse. Uh, measures a lot of basic things, but we can plug in what we want. Very low power, it's got a solar cell, it's got some hours of sunlight can power it up for the, the whole day pretty easily. And again, since it's wetland, we put, we put sensors in that go into the soil. Uh, we can easily attach it with telco cinch connectors. This is a sensor here in the soil. We commission it with a phone, we know the location. Uh, we can activate it, turn it on, and then it streams. We made 300 of them. And we put them all over. <laughs> so we've got them in this bog measuring lots of things, lots of places. This is a transect here. Uh, this is a high-speed video. You see the sand flow. And environmental uh, wetland researchers have never seen this. They know the sand flows, but our data, we store it all. It goes audio, video, sensor data goes back uh, four or five years. Uh, you can go to the website. I'll do that very quickly. Here's the site. We can look at real-time data. So here we are in Plymouth. Um, should be an image popping up at some point, but there's the data. And uh, you know, we can look at light levels. We can look at soil parameters. We can go back weeks or months or whatever we want, right? So this is the whole week. Um, and we can listen. Of course, my doorbell does this, so it's not as big a deal as it used to be. Go to different different sides, same thing. So we've got the instrumentation out there. Um, but we can also bring it into a virtual world. This relates a bit to the afternoon. We built a virtual analog of the landscape, like we did for our building. We built it for this area. We scan the uh, laser scan, the topography. We have cameras, of course, there, and they look at what kind of stuff grows. We have a, an algorithm that actually will synthesize the vegetation based on what it sees in the camera, more or less. Um, and then we can animate the sensor values in different ways. I normally would run it, there's not much time, plus the, the game engine wasn't working well from here for some reason. So this is a video that shows what the experience is like. You can download it and run it. So it's running in Unity, this is the sensor updating. The music comes from the sensors too. We built a framework so that different composers can do different kinds of pieces based on the data. We've got three pieces running there now. If it rains in the real world, it rains in the virtual world. If it snows in the real world, it snows in the virtual world. It's an avatar landscape. But it's a wetland now. This is another view where we emphasize the sensor data. Uh, and uh, you can move. Now, if I were walking through this, it would take a long time. Uh, but here in the virtual world, you don't get Lyme disease uh, from the ticks that are all over the place there, and you can move around quick. There are animals there, but the animals feed off the sensor data and change. This is a, another musical piece that maps. You can toggle those if you want to run the demo. So a different way of interacting with the sensor data, bringing it up to people. Uh, this is a current animal, they, uh, they're more abstract now. Uh, so we can change the parameters and the yeah, history of how the temperature and humidity have been over days, right? The animal can change its appearance in different ways. You see them as ghosts. 
we have all the microphones, uh, so we can do uh, machine learning on them and identify the wildlife. We've been doing that now for the last couple of years. Um, so you, you know, lots of cicadas. I could run this in real time too, but there's, there's no time. Go to tidzam.media.mit.edu. You can actually run it at this point. There's not so much happening now because it's getting quiet in the winter. But uh, again, it classifies on the different mics and, and locates. Uh, so over spring day, you can see this. Spring peepers in the morning and the evening, and then the birds come out. Uh, you can go down, drill down, look at the species of birds, see what happens. We're doing longitudinal analysis of this data over the course of the lot of years that we have audio to see what's happened to the different species. And again, the better the training, the better this thing gets at classifying. Um, this is the last thing here. This is a, uh, all I've shown so far as a remote user looking at, at Tidmarsh from you know, here in Austin, right? Uh, what if you're physically on the property? Can we enhance your senses with some sort of a wearable where we can tunnel in, depending on where you're looking, uh, where you're paying attention to the different, uh, different sounds coming from the microphones and sensors? So this is the first version of it. This is Gershon Dublon, one of my PhD students who just finished. Uh, we did a lot of work for attention tracking, so pupil diameter, EEG, stuff like this. This was a pain in the neck to wear, and the features we got from these other measurements weren't that valuable. In the end, we just went to the IMU. Because if you see where people are looking, you get direction. We need that anyway for the audio to change. And uh, if you're not moving, if your gaze is steady, then you're focusing. So when you're focusing, we can get the sound coming from the microphones and the sensors. We don't cover the ears either. We use bone conduction. You can see it more clearly here. So uh, uh, it's like you have an extra set of ears. And it's a very different experience. If you covered your ears, it wouldn't be the same. You hear with your ears, but you hear also through this. It's like you have superpower hearing. Suddenly you're in this world where you're just plugged into a world that, that, that you never knew was there, but it is there. Closest I can come to is uh, if you've ever had your ears cleaned, if they've been badly clogged up with wax. I mean, it happened to me once when I was a student. I, I got it cleared out. I didn't know I, I had this. It was cleared out. Suddenly I, I, heard, I was living in a different auditory world. I was hearing things in a way I never heard before. It was wonderful for three or four days until I got used to it. Uh, this is the same thing. You wander through with this, you just don't want to take it off, especially in the spring. You can even walk through in the winter and have it be the spring on your, your hearing. Bose collaborated with us, and that inspired their glasses, actually, with the over ear sound. It was one of the inspirations for it. So these are people. This is actually Dan Gager, one of the main guys at Bose. Designed, he's designed most of their headphones. or had Life. a big role in them. <laughs> so for him, this is a new experience. As I move my head, this is one of our environmental I go collaborators. From the tree bird. And now I'm hearing more ducks and geese and froggy frogs. And I put on my supersonic beam action. And now that's really all I'm getting. So we could force and it to converge in the sensors in front if you touch. This way. I can really hone in. There must be one right there. This woman uh, that's coming up is a naturalist who's a Luddite, more or less. She didn't like technology. She's a very respected naturalist. She just got a cell phone recently. And for her, this was a different experience. I know when I walk through the woods, I think I'm looking first and I'm listening second. Mm -hmm. So this is a, yeah, this is bringing listening. This is really cool. So it's a different experience. So, you know, I'm, I'm just and a whole way to, to interact with the landscape. I'm hoping that Audubon will give visitors to this site. Audubon has taken it over, this, is uh, this system to be able to use when they, they walk around. No, more, no, no real time for cognitive audio, but we think a lot in the group about uh, trying to build uh, embedded systems that can sample audio, but not in a way that we do with MP3 with perceptive compression, more cognitive. What sounds would you notice, right? What, do you pay, what would you pay attention to, rather than just uh, masking with frequencies, so on and so forth. There's a video about it, but you guys can go on and find it. This is the last thing I'm going to show. Uh, it's an old project again, but it's a good way to end the talk. Um, you, you may remember this, Edison. We built a badge, a lot of badges at the Media Lab. Went to a whole bunch of them. This was a, one of the badges I thought to end all badges. I put everything in the world into it, uh, including a big display. Uh, and it had a bunch of sensors on it. It had wireless, of course, had infrared, so you could see if you were facing someone else. We could locate people in the building with a wireless and send commands to it. Um, and this is work we did with Sandy Penland's group. The very beginning of social interaction with a wearable at the level of, of gauging interest. So we could predict with just the sensors on the badge if you were interested in somebody else, right? Because we had this thing where you could take a business card by facing someone and pushing the button. Just by looking at features from the sensor values in the seconds before you know, they, they bookmarked, we could tell if you were, you were interested or not fairly reliably. So the sensors could predict. 
Uh, also, if you're interested in the demo, we could, we could tell the same thing. This isn't just you getting moving the button. This is actually looking beforehand at, at, at how still you were, how much you're moving, how your voice was changing, a microphone, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, this was the killer app, right? So imagine they're, they're all wireless. I'm in a room like this. You all have them. I'm talking a little bit too long. It's time for me to stop. Uh, we could flash the timekeeping cues to the speaker from the badges. Because uh, we have these big events at the Media Lab, you remember the Madison twice a year, all the sponsors come, uh, we all talk about our latest work, we tend to talk too long, and it would run over. So before we had the badges, we would have this big tail of people running over too much. Uh, once we had the badges, the tail was, was attenuated, people would, would be encouraged to stop. Uh, one of these guys, though, Bill Mitchell, we lost him way, way too soon from the Media Lab professor, he passed away probably seven, eight years ago now. Um, whoops. He, uh, oh, it's not here. Of all the ways to end my talk, uh, give me one second, I can find it very quickly. Bartos badge flash. With this build up, it's converting. It's already converted somewhere. There it is. Come on. Let's try this. Actually, this is a better one. It's the 1.5x. This is sped up. Good. So here's Bill talking. Uh, I sped it up so it goes quickly. So he's starting to run out of time. He's just about out of time. And he doesn't, they don't see them because they're looking forward. He sees all of them. And finally, before these things start to flicker at you, let me show you the city that we're working on. So watch what happens when you get out of He's out of time now. But he keeps talking. So we had to try to attract his attention. Didn't work that well. So we got literal. The bill kept talking. With, um, uh, the advantages that we can get sort of car, and so he's going to smash off that thing. He's getting nervous. So the city car has these advantages. You get through with these stacks. Um, so you had to get a little more from uh, wind power, even with energy sources. You're also able to pump electricity back into the grid from these stacks at peak loading conditions. You get no tailpipe emissions. But he uh, still didn't work. stop. So, you so no fundamental so he had to get a bit more strenuous. Uh, together. We can build this tomorrow, and in fact, we will. We're starting right now. So thank you. So concluded. So with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was such a wonderful tour of all of your work for the last 20 years. This is terrific. Thank you, Edison. Uh, we'll have uh, maybe uh, time for maybe a couple of questions uh, quickly before our break. So we have a microphone. Hopefully they're working. There, my work, my group, we haven't done work with patients of that sort, but other groups, I think, have touched on it more. Ross Picard, certainly she's working on autistic patients. She, uh, I think uh, Patty has worked a bit with uh, Alzheimer's patients, Patty Mays recently, too. Uh, she's worked with memory, so trying to uh, help people uh, recall. The stuff we're doing with focus might, might help them a little bit, too. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the famous work, of course, of Microsoft with the camera that would take pictures every minute and playing that back, ways of compressing people's day uh, in a very efficient way to try to bring back recollection. That, that's known to help. There's work at the Media Lab now on 40 hertz, actually. So 40, 40 hertz modulation in sound and light, uh, there's some clear inclination now that it can help people avoid Alzheimer's, right? The clinical studies are still happening, but there's a strong indication. So Todd McOver is collaborating with Ed Boyden, our brain guy, to uh, build audio environments that, that, that have 40 hertz or, you know, 40 hertz modulation in the light, things like that. So that, that is happening now. So I, I noticed that most of, well, um, none of the work you showed was subcutaneous, where you were injecting yeah. anything. Uh, do you have a philosophical disagreement with that, or is it just mo more difficult to do, pursue research in it? Do, could you? I think it's, it's more the latter. The subcutaneous work, that really counts as happening in the medical community for prosthetics and things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, 
the stuff we do rides on top of that for the most part. We did have Katia Vega in my group for some years. She's now at UC Davis. Uh, she was known for uh, functional makeup and uh, things of that sort, but she did do a piece which was a tattoo for diabetics that would change color with insulin. Now, of course, it was early work. She had to die. She worked at Harvard Medical School. They used pig skin. They showed that it could work, but it did not go through anything close to clinical trials. This stuff could be toxic, so on and so forth. The danger there is that everybody in the world calls me up and you know, all the diabetics want to use it, and I feel bad because we're far from it. Uh, so we dabbled in that a bit. To do it seriously, as you know, it's just an immense effort. You can be a grinder and just implant an RFID card or a magnet. People do that on their own. You know, there's a community that does that. It's not a scientific community for the most part. It, 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 it has an interface to HCI, but it's, it's really at the fringe. I think the most interesting work is happening really in the medical and prosthetic community. We do have Hugh here at the Media Lab looking at uh, robotic prosthetics, and he's very big now into neural connections, so we see it, see it there. Okay, so now we are breaking, and uh, we will have some uh, food for you outside, and also please check out the post.
So this is the part of our program where we're going to get deeper into um, wearable devices. Um, and so we're going to have three talks now back to back that are going to be about different aspects of wearable devices, wearable sensing, uh, different uh, um, wearable um, uh, electronics. And, and so it's going uh, to be a fun time. And then right, right after that, we're going to have our, our lunch break. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Wei Gao. Uh, Wei Gao is an assistant professor at uh, um, Caltech uh, in medical engineering. He's really interested in the future of personalized and precision medicine. He's done uh, tremendous work in the space of uh, wearable health monitors uh, and also nanorobots, which is, uh, uh, I love to hear more about that. Uh, and uh, he got his PhD in chemical engineering from UC San Diego and completed a postdoc at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's received uh, numerous awards, um, the IEEE Sensor, Sensors Council Technical Achievement Award, early career in 2019, the 2018 Sensors uh, Young Investigator Award. Um, also, um, he was selected for the MIT uh, TR35, um, which I'm not sure if, it, if it's an actual, an actual uh, technically an award, but it's a, it's a wonderful recognition. Right? And so uh, we're very excited to have you here and, and looking forward to learning more about your work. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, this is Wei Gao, Assistant Professor of Medical Engineering from Caltech. It's wonderful to be here today to share our research on wearable biosensors for personalized health monitoring. So my lab is still pretty new at Caltech. I joined the Caltech basically two years ago, and this is my team right now. And we are focusing on mainly two topics. So today's main topic will be the wearable biosensors. We also have some effort on synthetic micro nano robot just two slides on our second topic, medical micro nano robot. Basically, we are preparing this kinds of micro nano scale robot or motors uh, with a size ranging from like a 50 nanometer to 50 micrometer that could move very efficiently in different kinds of body fluid and we could put into the animal body and toward the drug delivery or precision surgery. So some videos to show you, this is a bubble propelled micro engine. We can use the magnetic guidance to really control the moving direction that could move very fast, up to like 10 millimeter per second. The size of this micro robot is only seven micrometer. So we can control this, you know, they can enter a lemon chip micro fluidic channel and they can move it against very strong flow as well. So very recently, in collaboration with Li Hong Wang, another professor at, at Caltech, uh, f focusing on like uh, photoacoustic imaging, we developed this technology. You can real time track this micro robot in vivo. Basically, this is a robot that you can, we can carry a loaded drug into the body, and we can encapsulate the, uh, this robot into a micro capsule. Basically, when we inject this micro capsule into the mice body, you know, you see the micro capsule. Basically, they can enter through the GI track, you can real-time track the location of this micro capsule. So when this micro robot actually reaches the disease area, such as like a colon tumor, you can activate this micro robot that can start to move very efficiently and penetrate the mucus and deliver drug much more efficiently. So this is the recent work for our micro nano robot. So come back to today's main topic, wearable biosensors. Also today is basically the conference, one of the main topic. As we all know, wearables could very, play a very important role in personalized healthcare because they can continuously collect data from our body and tell us what's going on and what's going wrong with our health. There's a lot of commercial products, very uh, nice product, as you can see, like Apple Watch, Fitbit, they can track our health already, but they mainly track the physical parameters, like heart rate and EKG, and, but cannot provide more useful information about our health at a molecular level. So we think the major challenge, which is also a great opportunity in the field right now, is how can we collect the chemical or molecular information continuously and ideally non-invasively. So one of the main topics in my group, we are looking at human sweat. You know, sweat is a very important body fluid. Uh, you, we can retrieve sweat conveniently, continuously, and non-invasively. 
In fact, you can find various biomarkers or analyzed from sweat, such as electrolyte, like sodium chloride, uh, like metabolized so glucose, lactate, and urea, uric acid. And people can see like a more than 30 amino acids and more than 300 proteins. And we can also find various hormones, like a stress hormone cortisol in our sweat. So you can actually also see other substances, like heavy metals, drugs, alcohols, and even cosmetics from your skin. So if we can monitor sweat, we could potentially monitor health from the skin non-invasively. But some people may see, I don't know much about uh, sweat tests, the application of the sweat tests. Basically, it's something not new. In the past decade, it has been used for some applications. One of the classic examples is disease diagnosis, like cystic fibrosis, using sweat chloride as a standard. Sweat can also be used for like doping control, drug dosage control, or genomic studies, and also very importantly, fitness monitoring. But still, not widely being used. One of the major reasons is accuracy. Because in the past, how people do the sweat test, they put, a skin, they put a patch on the skin and collect the sweat over like a day or several days. Then they send out this skin patch into a laboratory using LCMS to run some tests. As you can imagine, these tests, you cannot get a real-time information and require very bulky in instrument. The real-time information is very important because you know, sweat analyzes very a lot. That's why the very controversial conclusion was drawn Basically, in the past, say there was no good correlation between this sweat analyte and the other blood analyte. So that's the main problem. Imagine that if we are able to develop a skin patch, you can place on the skin and real-time analyze all the biomarkers from sweat. You could use this device for fitness tracking, disease diagnosis, and very importantly, this large set of data collected by the device can be used for numerous fundamental and clinical investigations. So in 2016, I developed a fully integrated platform for in situ sweat analysis. Basically, this version, the first prototype we can also call this, can simultaneously monitor like metabolized glucose lactate, electrolytes such as sodium and potassium, along with the skin temperature. So the full system is flexible. You can wear this as different body part. And the device can perform you know, on-site signal conditioning, processing, and wireless transmission. So all the data will be sent to cell phone. We also developed the cell phone app. You can read the value from your cell phone directly, and in the end, you can send the data to the computer or save the data to the cloud. So basically, in the first version, we have like two parts of the, for the device. The left side is a disposable sensor patch, very easy to fabricate, and it can be, re uh, can be replaced very easily. Also, in like two, three seconds, you can replace a new page. The right side is a reusable PCB, basically, a flexible PCB. And we pick all the five target analyte because we thought at that time they were pretty useful because glucose lactate, you know, glucose is reported to be related with the blood glucose level. Uh, lactate is a biomarker for athletic performance. And sodium, potassium, they are very informative for our skin, uh, basically our body hydration or dehydration status. And skin temperature is very uh, informative for many skin related diseases. It can also be used for calibrate other sensors reading. So basically, Briefly, for glucose and lactate sensor, they're based on enzymatic reactions. We are using glucose oxidase, lactate oxidase to ensure they have good selectivity. We are actually monitoring the current difference between the working electrode and the reference counter electrode. So the current is linear to the concentration of glucose and lactate in your sweat. So we are using pigeon blue as a mediator, which can lower the operation voltage to around zero volt. Very importantly, by control the if, uh, control the preparation of this layer, you can control the uh, like sensitivity and the linear range as well. For example, glucose, you need very high accuracy because glucose in sweat is roughly like 100 times lower than blood. But lactate is opposite. Lactate in sweat is much higher than blood ones. So you need a wider linear range. So for sodium, potassium, and other ions, we basically use ion selective sensors. So ion selective membrane is very important here. In the membrane, we have a chemical Ion four. Basically, for each ion, we have a specific ion four. They have good selectivity to a specific ion. For sodium, we have sodium ion for X. For potassium, we have volanomycin. So, for example, why they can recognize the target? This is the potassium ion four. Has a ring structure. The ring structure has a similar size 
to the potassium ion. Basically, the potassium ion can go inside this ring and set the voltage of this ion selective sensor. You're measuring basically the voltage difference between the wo uh, working electrode and the reference electrode. So the voltage difference is linear to the logarithm concentration of the target ions. So as you can see, for sodium and potassium Z equal to one, your slope is 59.16 millivolt per decade of concentration. So all the sensors, when they work together, you know, if you vary one analytic concentration, the response of other sensors remains stable, showing the good selectivity. This is under one condition, as you can see, fixed temperature. So what if you change the temperature? You know, our skin temperature is not like our body temperature. Our skin temperature can vary a lot. Like uh, some of my students, uh, their temperature in the cold room can be like a 14 degrees C, but some guys can be like a 35, 36 degrees C, you know, very big difference from 22 degrees C to like 37 degrees C, glucose and lactose sensor response changed like 70% already. If you don't do any calibration, you won't get any meaningful reading, basically. So for wearables, you know, one of the major focus we are trying to do to make sensor very stable because nobody wants to do a calibration that do like 10 minutes measurement and then take off. I want to see how much I'm reading. That's not ideal. You want to make sure your sensor is stable, can be used for a very long time. And we did a lot of like engineering work to improve the sensitivity and stability. For example, our sodium and potassium sensors, the variation of batch to batch is less than 1% in sensitivity. One of the sodium sensors we continuously use for three days. The, without any calibration, the sensing accuracy is less than three, and basically the error is less than 3%. We think it's pretty good already. We can use the sensor for like a very long time, like sodium and potassium. We can store the sensor for several months as well. We can package this sensor into different form, like a wristband, armband. You can really get the real-time information while you are doing exercise. This is our Android cell phone app interface. As you can see, you can read each analyte level from the screen. You can also track the progression profile in the past you know, hour also. And you have the option to save the data. This is the one typical curve. We worked with George Brooks with the exercise physiology at UC Berkeley at that time. We can track this dynamic profile of your, the sweat analyte during the physical activities. As I said, this large set of data, right now the data is not large, but you can imagine you could continue to collect data potentially from your daily activity. The whole set of data could be very large, can be used for different kinds of applications. Some potential applications I want to show here one is like a dehydration monitoring. You know, dehydration is very important to monitor during the sport medicine, like when you run marathon, and also it's very important for many patients. For the elderly patients, you know, they usually don't recognize they're dehydrated, which is very dangerous for them, as many clinicians told me, basically. We did this kind of human study, as you can see, one group was asked to constantly drink water, basically every five minutes they need to drink water fixed amount of water. But the second group were not allowed to drink any water. You can see the sodium level changed a lot in the sweat in the end of the exercise when they had lost around 2% of body weight of water, which is a clear indication of dehydration. We can say that like sodium could be a potential biomarker for dehydration monitoring. And one of the topics we are working on is for CKD, because you know, sweat contains many important biomarkers related with our kidney function. One of these is Calcium. We are also working on uric acid, urea, creatinine. So take calcium as one example. Um, um, for the patient on dialysis, actually, their calcium level is twice as high as a healthy subject. So if we could monitor the calcium and other kidney biomarker from our skin, we could potentially monitor the CKD condition, basically. And the skin is our small kidney. But calcium level in our sweat or our body fluid is depending on the pH. You know, when the pH is low, your calcium level is higher, of course. So in this case, only monitoring the calcium is not enough. So we need to monitor calcium and pH together. Basically, using the same platform, we develop the sensor array. Like uh, for calcium, we use ETH 101 as an ion film. With pH, we're using polymerized polyaniline as a selective film. So we can monitor the calcium pH over time, and they're pretty accurate. We calibrated the sensor. You can see the commercial meet, uh, pH meter and ICPMIs. Another possible application is the heavy metal monitoring, because we are exposed to heavy metal every day throughout food or water intake. In the, the past few years, uh, in Michigan Flint, 
the water contamination has already caused many children's health problems because of later contamination in water. So basically, most of the heavy metal you took every day come out through the urine and through the sweat from your skin. So if you monitor the heavy metal from your skin, basically you couldn't know your daily exposure, actually. So this is very important, but you know, heavy metal level is very low. Probably people don't know, but your sweat still contains lead or mercury possibly. And so how can we detect this trace level heavy metal? So we are using a stripping photomic gray method. You are using, basically apply a very low voltage. The heavy metal ions can be deposited or pre-concentrated onto your microelectrode. So after this pre-concentration process, which can only take like one minute, so you can sweep the voltage from low to high using differential pulses. The heavy metal film can be oxidized at different voltage. By monitoring the current peak at certain voltage, you know certain heavy metal concentration. And you can see, using gold, we can monitor lead, copper, and mercury. And using bismuth, we can monitor zinc, cadmium, and lead. So why we need the both? Because the gold electrode is good for the high voltage metals, but not good for low voltage metals such as zinc. Depositing zinc requires very low voltage, which will cause strong hydrogen evolution on gold electrode, which, which influence your sensor accuracy in this case. So having this microsensor array, we can monitor five heavy metals real time from our skin. Till now, maybe some people may have a question. Because you're doing sweat sensor, what if I don't sweat? So will your device be useful, right? So we have to address one problem, how to access sweat without exercise. We cannot ask everyone to bike or running all the time to get some data. That's not ideal. So especially for the clinical study, because we are medical engineering, so we work a lot with the clinician right, right now. How can we force the patient to wake up and do some cycling or running, right? So we have to address this issue. So we found that there is a process they can locally introduce or induce sweat, a process called antiphoresis. So basically, you apply a small current through the skin, and the positively charged drug molecules can enter your skin, basically stimulate the sweat gland and trigger the sweating process. So this is the process people use to induce sweat and collect sweat for cystic fibrosis diagnosis. So inspired by this, we developed our generation two device a platform that can perform on-demand sweat extraction and the sensing. So basically, you still control from a cell phone. If you want to do sweat analysis, just click a button from a cell phone. The small current will flow your skin for a very short time, a few minutes, basically. Then this is mode one. In mode two, your sweat will come out in the following hour or even several hours, depending on how you engineer this sweat induction process. All you need is just apply the current for a minute or a few minutes. Then you get a several hour sweat, and only from this small area. So in this case, the sensor will real-time analyze your sweat by a marker from your skin, and you don't feel anything. You basically like still wearing a watch, but you get all this chemical information continuously. So we work with Stanford School of Medicine and we try to characterize this uh, sweat process by using different kinds of drug and different amount of drug, for example. This type of drug is pretty safe because, for example, pyrocarbon is FDA approved. People use this for sweat induction in the newborn, the infants, basically. You can imagine for adults, it's no any problem. So different kind of drug and drug dosage has very different influence on how you're sweating. So why does this drug work? You can, trigger, you can think of this way. The way we are sweating is because our brain sends a signal to our skin. You want to sweat. But in this case, send a neurotransmitter to our skin. In this case, you are locally introduce the neurotransmitter, tell the sweat gland, sweat. So without basically bypass the brain passively, like actively induce sweat from, from, the, from the skin, in this case, actively. So some drugs, as you can see, like acetylcholine, has a very small response latency. That means after you apply current, within one minute, like 52 seconds, sweat will come out already. So you can periodically induce sweat as well using the same device. Like if you only apply 10 second current, basically you can still get 15 minutes sweating process. If you think this is not enough, you can apply longer, you can get like one hour. Now you're using different drug, we can get several hours sweating process, which is very attractive for continuous monitoring, especially for clinical uh, like applications. So some example application of the wearable sweat sensor for clinical study 
or medical applications is really medical monitoring and diagnosis without accessing blood. So one of the applications we are trying in collaboration with the Stanford Cystic Fibrosis Center, we apply this technology for CF diagnosis and CF screening. As I said, sweat test is the gold standard for CF, basically CF diagnosis. By, uh, you know, in a clinical setting, people collect sweat and send out sweat for the laboratory, take a week to get some data. In this case, we can, within 20 minutes, you can get a very accurate reading of your sweat, sodium, chloride, just using automatic sweat induction and sensing. So you can see statistic data, the same patients, their sodium chloride level much higher than healthy subject. So using this, you can say that our device can be used for screening and pre basically at least a screening and diagnosis of CF. This is the first application. The second application, is, which is also the main focus in my current lab, the drug monitoring. You know the drug metabolism are very person to person. For the elderly and for the newborn or for the kids especially, uh, and for the for people like obesity people and senior people, their metabolic rate can vary several times. But uh, before, for one example is the bisulfa, you know, uh, before the pharmacokinetic model was developed, it caused many, the deaths of many children because of the dose. So right now we don't have much control. You know, you take a pill every day, for example, the medication tells you like this. So, but many drugs have a very narrow therapeutic window. If your dose level is very high, it has a very strong toxic effect or side effect. If your dose level is not high enough, you don't get, you don't get enough treatment. So you want your drug level remain in the, within the therapeutic window over a long time. But there is no good approach to do this. It makes therapeutic monitoring, TDM. Right now, it's drawing the blood. Ask the patient to come to the clinical setting, draw the blood, making plasma, then send it to a, like a drug laboratory using LCMS to do drug test, which take like two days, basically, at least, to get one point, your body drug level. But you know, drug metabolism vary a lot from one person bo in one person's body. That is the problem. How can we achieve the drug personalization using a non-invasive approach? You know, sweat test could be a very promising solution. Before uh, I have my own lab, because we don't have good clinical collaborator, this is how I demonstrated this could be working, this approach. Using caffeine as a drug. Because caffeine is a drug. Uh, it's very easy to do the human study in this case. We just our, ask our student, you know, uh, you recruit a student, drink one shot of coffee, two shot of coffee, three shot of coffee, it's very easy to control the dose. But you can still see, we could monitor ca caffeine using our nano-engineered electrode, it's a few micromolar level. During the physical exercise, you can real-time check, not only have to be like a, a really exercise, if you do like iron forces, basically, you even can do a computer, while you are doing computer work, you can monitor drug level. The caffeine level reached the peak at around one hour. That means after you drink coffee, probably, the moment you feel best, it's after one hour. After that, your caffeine level quickly drops from your body. You know, other drugs have different metabolic rate, of course. So right now, we found a very good collaborator at the City of Hope. We are working on a number of anti-cancer drugs on the cancer patient. One of the very promising number I want to share with you is we recruit a cancer patient. Actually, of all the patients who were offered for participation, 75% of patients said yes. So they think, that means they think this approach could be very useful. We get a lot of sample already from the cancer patient trying to do drug personalization using our wearables. So people very often can have another question. So how about you know, the evaporation or skin contamination will influence your sensing accuracy? And will how, basically the sweat is red. How fast you sweat will affect the sweat composition or not? The answer is could be. Because many biomarkers in our sweat, they are depending on the sweat rate, while many are not. So it's a complicated process. That's why it's very important to have a sweat rate sensor. They can real time calibrate such difference. In this case, actually, microfluidics also play a very important role. Using the microfluid module, we could monitor sweat rate. We could also really like miniaturize the influence of skin contamination or evaporation. So this is the microfluid module. The first one we showed with the two parallel electrodes in the channel. By measuring the impedance between the two electrodes, you can actually get the sweat rate information. 
So right, oh, right now, in my lab, actually, all the devices, basically, they are based on microfluidics. Yeah, you don't have much skin evaporation issue, and you can get a very high temporary solution as well for the chemical sensing. So one of the work I want to share with you is still unpublished. It's using a mobile or wearable surprise sensor to monitor stress response. Uh, right now, this project is funded by NASA for deep space stress and anxiety monitoring. So, as we know, for stress, uh, stress response is very important for human performance. And uh, cortisol is one of the well-known stress hormone, which change rapidly in response to a different kind of stress event. The circadian rhythm of cortisol is even more informative. You can, like, it can be related to different kinds of metabolic disorder and depression. For example, like a diabetic patient have different, unique, like a circadian rhythm of cortisol. But depression patients, they have different uh, circadian rhythm. How to monitor cortisol rapidly using a mobile health device is very important. And very recently, we developed the device, and we actually found that sweat cortisol really reflects your blood cortisol level and in a very rapid way. And I actually did this study myself. I was the first subject to do this study. How we introduce uh, stress, for example. We are using a standard test, cold pressure test. Basically, put my hand into ice water. Guess what I feel? Pain. So the first time while I was doing this, all my lab members are just looking at me. I feel so embarrassed. I feel even more stressful. You know, like I, later on, I wonder why everybody would look at me. I found that you know, when people look at you, you have more stress. And the most important reason for them is that everyone, they put $1, they just like beg how long I can last. Like one minute, two minutes, three minutes, I can keep my hand into the ice water. Basically, you can real-time check your stress hormone in sweat change very quickly while you, while you put your hand into uh, cold, cold ice, basically. That's just one stressor. There are many other stressors we are trying. So at last, last uh, slide about technical is just how to produce the sensor large scale and low cost. The cost is very important if you really want to make a product. So in collaboration with Professor Chu in Korea, actually, we are trying to use row to row to print the electrode. As you can see, you can really print the millions of electrodes in one row, the hundreds of meters of row, like printing newspapers. Still very high performance. So right now, like, uh, we are focusing on a lot of more markers. Like we monitor different kinds of nutrients, peptide, hormone, and uh, like a different kind of drugs as well. We are working closely with the clinician like the City of Hope, Cedar Sinai, uh, USC, UCLA, and also the Lundquist Institute to monitor you know, cardiovascular disease, cancers, stress, depression, and also metabolic syndromes. Uh, we are also developing some vital science sensors to form the multimodal sensor. We think the fusion of different kinds of data, physical chemical information could be more informative. Then in the end, uh, we could use machine learning and big data analysis to get more meaningful information out of our skin. To summarize, we developed this sensor platform, and we have the potential to monitor like our fitness level and for disease diagnosis, and very importantly, such a large set of data collected wirelessly, non-invasively from our skin could be used for numerous applications. In the end, I would like to thank our group members, uh, collaborators, and our funding agents. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. All right, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, this, this work is tremendous. So we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Quick question, you didn't talk much about how you power these sensors. Are they powered by battery, or what's, and what's the battery life and things like that? Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we are using a small lithium battery. The, the power like uh, consumption is a few hundred microwatt. So one battery can last very long. We also have some uh, other energy harvesting strategy. For example, we are developing some biofuel cells. You can harvest energy from sweat. The, the energy you harvest is powerful enough to power the whole electronics, sensors, and the Bluetooth communication. One more? One more? No? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So next we have Alex Gao from uh, Samsung Research America. He's the um, head of, dig of the Digital Health Lab at Samsung. And um, as, as the name suggests, um, his work, his lab is focused on healthcare delivery uh, with digital technologies. Um, Alex uh, got his master's from Stanford and uh, his BS from Tsinghua University. And uh, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's very rare for me to follow another speaker whose last name uh, also Gao, <laughs> the first time ever. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty common uh, family name, but not that common. Um, so today's my talk is related, you know, the challenge and opportunities in applying wearables, H, uh, HCI, context wear computing uh, in uh, digital health innovation. Uh, we all know in the U United States, we're in the middle of uh, a transformation, right? The, uh, the healthcare industry, the four Ps, it used to be a provider-centric seeking for uh, payer, uh, reimbursement, and then there's pharma and their patient. Now the whole pyramid is turned upside down. Everything is becoming a patient-centric uh, viewpoint. And uh, even the patient, uh, now people say the line between the patient and consumer get really blurred. That means the patient is not being treated as a traditional, traditional sense of patient, but like a consumer in every other industry, such as retail or banking. The, uh, I think the Kaiser Foundation and the New York Times had an article talking about the future healthcare outcome, only 10% of which are actually from uh, uh, in-clinic hospital. And the single largest factor impact our healthcare outcome is um, behavioral, right? Uh, how we behave, what context we're in, and uh, what's the continuous you know, physiological signal that all these are possible with the digital technologies, thanks to the proliferation of the mobile and the wearable technology. Now, you know, even Samsung, we have over a billion uh, um, uh, mobile phone users, and uh, you know, so the hundreds of millions of other devices are in the hands of consumer. We, have, you know, with all these touch points in consumers' life, how we as technologists. And uh, also uh, working with academia, how we weave these uh, touch points into a cohesive story, taking care of um, patient or consumer, it, it's really the focus uh, of all of us and, uh, and the industry. So, so let's look at uh, the uh, opportunities, right? They, a lot of times, you know, many people for many generations been working in uh, health or healthcare, but not much success. And we realize, you know, the, uh, the industry of healthcare and the technology often innovate in a two parallel universe. So how to bring the two industries work together is really in a, a, a key ingredient to success. So we also realize, because it's patient-centric, right, so everything has to be user study-led, design thinking-led, be empathetic to the user, to the patient. And that's what, how we do it you know, and applying the agile development process and with a, a truly a multidisciplinary team under a shared vision to bring the, these solutions into the market. So let's speaking of uh, a human-centered design, how we empower a consumer and uh, in transforming how health or healthcare delivered. So this is a typical uh, flow chart for any design thinking, right? So you do um, the research of the problem, uh, you understand the requirement, and you're constantly you know, in the loop of uh, design, prototyping, and user test until you find the right minimum viable uh, product or prototype, and then you produce, you launch, and hopefully eventually you can uh, scale it in a real world setting, right? So these are the, the typical development process that especially Silicon Valley and the, the new tech company uh, we use in developing solutions. So let's, let me walk you through an example. So usually you start with interviewing uh, clinicians and the patients, uh, understand um, what are the user journey. And then you're going through the ideation and collecting voice of customer. And then really draw out the user journey and, uh, and uh, map the pain points of the patient 
against the user journey, right? So now we're still in the discovery phase. And then you start developing personas, right? You want to generalize and uh, oversimplify what are the typical persona, what are the typical problems, the hero scenario you're trying to uh, address. And then you, you discovery, you know, the synthesis, understanding what are the problem, high level problem you're solving. And then you're moving to the definition phase. You understand the market, your competitions, what are the solutions available out there. You start storyboarding the initial scenarios. You conceptualize and, uh, and start developing higher fidelity of uh, prototype. And you start translating that prototype into real product requirements with uh, information architecture. And then you really nail down the user experience screen by screen. You, you're going through the iterative design review and user testing with your target audience, both patients as well as clinicians. And then in the end, you come out with an end-to-end -end solution that are usually revolving around you know, a, a guardian angel experience with the patient, um, the wearable and the mobile. And we often enable a caregiver experience to involve the caregiver in participating um, the, the care delivery. And then you have a clinician dashboard to help the clinician to visualize uh, the trend and monitoring uh, the, uh, the patient progress or deterioration of their certain conditions. And then there's also uh, the technology company. You have your back end for data uh, analysis right, and machine learning. So let's look at uh, some of the digital health innovations applications. Some of you know are done in the in the Samsung uh, Research America Digital Health Lab. Some are you know very common for the industry. So let's start first, you know, home-based cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in US and in most part of the world. And it costs the system hundreds of billions of dollars, right? And um, so we know Cardiac rehabilitation is very effective. It, by following through the, uh, the regimen, you will be able to reduce uh, the fatal heart attack chance by like 28% for the next four years. But why it's not uh, really prevalent? Because access, right? Um, the, uh, if you, everything, right now, the, the whole healthcare system is delivering cardiac rehabilitation in the center base, so you have to bring patient in. It's an inconvenient, unscalable people, you know, I think nationwide it's 20 to 40% completion for, for this wonderful program. And uh, so what we do uh, is how we really digitize uh, this program and make it uh, uh, all unwearable. So streamline the process. And we, this, this uh, result actually caught the eyes of a New England Journal of Medicine um, catalyst and uh, we, we probably launched and conducted the world's largest uh, clinical studies with the Kaiser Permanente. 3,000 patients enrolled, uh, more than 2,000 graduated, uh, and we achieved a stunning 2% readmission rate compared to the nationwide 10 to 15% readmission. And as you may know, that readmission costs uh, a, a huge amount of money for the US healthcare system. Average case is a thirteen thousand six hundred dollar per case, and uh, two thousand seventeen, about seventy seven percent of U.S. hospitals are penalized by CMS for high rate admission. So let's take a look because we're talking about wearable, right? Let's take a look how this experience looked like. So it's a, it's a self contained experience, and uh, once uh, the subject wear the wearable. In the in a exercise, uh, will be able to measure their heart rate continuously and guide them. And the green bar in a, on a circle tell them what's their ideal heart rate. And we track continuously the duration of their workout, the steps, right, the distance they traveled. And at the end of it, uh, there's a, a by the digital regimen a required cool down. So I understand how heart rate recover. By understanding heart rate recover ratio, it's a good indication of uh, the heart condition. And then uh, you can select the activities you, you have done. 
and uh, enter the perceived exertion rate and reporting on the symptoms at the spot Right, that's the beauty of uh, uh, wearable. So you don't, you know, a lot of people they don't wear their uh, or bring their uh, mobile phone while they're working out. So by doing this, you know, all the data are going to be uh, um, synchronized uh, in a, in a mobile experience. So w during which we can monitor the day, week, and the whole program progress, trending. You know, each exercise, how their heart rate cr uh, cranking up and uh, settled to their uh, resting heart rate. And uh, the, there's also, you know, we have uh, a daily vitals, um, education materials, basically a regimen, right, for the subject to follow daily, weekly, and a whole program wise. And this help, uh, a, you know, achieve 87% compliance rate and completion rate, more, almost double, you know, the nation, national average. You know, you can either Bluetooth connecting to uh, some other peripheral devices to track your vital. Also, we give the uh, opportunity for the subject to, to manually input. So, so all this data also going to be synchronized uh, with the clinician, giving them a chance to visualize on their patient cohort as as well as each individual patient how their you know the, uh, their compliance, uh, the vital signs, and pointing out where um, the, uh, the nurses should intervene when the opportunity indicate. The highlighted red is indicate, you know, it's above certain threshold. So all these are defined by Kaiser Permanente. So I will skip this. And then another application is that we're working on pulmonary disease maintenance, the COPD and uh, asthma, right? In combination, it's uh, uh, over 50 million Americans are affected by the, by the COPD and asthma. Uh, number three cause of deaths and uh, impacting the US healthcare system over $150 billion annually. And uh, so is there a way uh, we could actually developing digital biomarkers uh, in a passive fashion, understanding uh, the the lung condition uh, in terms of uh, you know your progress for the better or deteriorate um, causing potential asthma attack or COPD exacerbation. Now, can we use acoustic signal right to track uh, the the subject cough and speech and understanding certain digital biomarker in um, detecting symptom and predict, predicting certain important uh, lung uh, biomarkers such as how fast you can empty your lung in one second and uh, and what's the ratio in that one second compared to your total lung capacity. These are very well known uh, biomarker to indicate how obstructive the lung condition is. So in the end result as you can see it's very similar to um, the home-based cardiac rehabilitation. Right? It's, it's an end-to-end -end, uh, workflow focused uh, wearable-centric uh, digital solution. So speaking of digital solution, right, we can also providing um, a remote patient monitoring for oncology patient. And this is a use case we have done with a partner uh, in tracking uh, a cancer patient who are on oral chemotherapy. And oral chemotherapy is really, um, it's a trial and error, right? I, I think less than 50% of the drug are effective. and. Uh, they're essentially just a uh, toxic, and uh, the theory is it, hopefully you can kill the cancer cells faster than you kill the subject. And uh, it wouldn't be nice that we actually, instead of a complete trial and error, we can reduce that cycle from uh, four to six weeks into maybe two to three weeks. Uh, it's not only reduce the pain, but as well as saving a lot of cost uh, for the healthcare system. Uh, so again, it's from a, a clinical proven end-to-end -end point of view uh, in developing the solution, as well as uh, we're also monitoring certain physiological signal uh, in correlating to the uh, patient survey, understanding is there a way that we can more um, passively and objectively measure the pain level. 
so you can take a take a look at a, the flow. So it's a clinician, caregiver, as well as patient. It's a patient-focused solution, you know, medication, adherence, education, uh, vital signal uh, monitoring, trend, education, uh, patient diary, journal, communication with uh, your clinical team, with the clinic, or with clinician uh, in the loop is effective for patient engagement. So these are the clinician dashboard where you can monitor the, uh, the individual as well as the cohort, um, their, vi their vital, their compliance, um, their uh, side effects, and omni-channel communication across the patient, the caregiver, and the clinical team right from the app, from the wearable and mobile. Uh, understanding the care plan, uh, documenting it, tracking it, um, four stage sleep tracking. So it's all done in a HIPAA compliant fashion. So, um, so Professor Gao is talking about how important uh, stress and uh, blood pressure, right, hypertensive condition, right? It's a one of the three uh, American adults has actually suffered hypertensive condition. And the cost system also tens of billion dollars. And we have worked with uh, our partner UCSF in developing a research program that to track um, the blood pressure and infer uh, subject stress level right from uh, the mobile and wearable. So it's a research program that we are able to uh, do the blood pressure, right, without FDA clearance, uh, because it's under uh, the FDA, uh, sorry, the UCSF RRB. So we are understanding how the blood pressure, the uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, that infer uh, the, the mental health. We also develop uh, algorithms that based on physiological and a contextual response. I mean, contextual is hugely important, right? We want to understand the stress are caused by you know, what time, uh, with whom, and uh, where, and uh, hopefully under uh, what, what circumstances. And we also developed the insights intervention module to not only assess the stress, but also intervene uh, and, uh, and mediate that uh, condition at the spot. And speaking of... Um, Wearable, right? I mean, VR headset is also a sort of wearable. So there, this is an innovative project. Uh, we work with uh, our uh, headquarter collaborators using a uh, Samsung VR headset to help the visual impaired. It, it's actually a very phenomenal uh, and large uh, demographic. You know, they, these people, uh, they're visually impaired, but not, they're not blind. Uh, their number one enjoyment is actually watching television. And uh, with uh, the, uh, the VR headset, they will be able to see it more clearly. Uh, so we actually enhance the visual and improve uh, their um, visibility. And also we are uh, trying to address some of the uh, most common, you know, like uh, uh, macular degeneration and glaucoma conditions. Um, And another innovation application is a uh, we, we talked about home-based cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab, right? And what about home-based virtual uh, orthopedic rehabilitation? Um, we know the uh, orthopedic rehabilitation is big. U United States every year we have about 750 uh, knee replacement and about 320 hip replacement. And how these uh, patients, how we can help them recover, especially these people, you know, their, their mobility is impacted. It's very difficult for them to move to a physical clinics. Can we actually conduct uh, the physical therapy at home uh, with technology, right? And uh, there are other conditions that actually require this solution in the injury, uh, hip, you know, uh, fracture, uh, things like that, frozen shoulder. So, and speaking of wearable, it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, small and on the wrist. And, and let's uh, take a look at a, another type of wearable solution that we have. So this is a, a hip assist uh, solution. 
Hip Assist V3 is a device for the elderly who have weak muscles, stroke, and neuropathy patients. It can help their walking and rehabilitation. The device is lightweight and slim. It can minimize the burden on the user and help reduce up to 20% of the energy needed for walking. The device is equipped with actuators on the left and right hip joints to help the joints flexion and extension. First, the user wears the device on the waist after adjusting its size. Next, attach the thigh frame and fasten the thigh strap. After turning the power switch on in the back, the device can be operated simply by using the mode switch on both sides. Now, we will demonstrate the clinical effects of the Hip Assist V3 for the elderly and various patients. For patients who have difficulty walking due to stroke, The walking speed and balance has been improved when they are assisted by our device. The sit-to-stand speed is also increased. Also, by ensuring foot clearance of the affected side during stair climbing, their walking speed and safety are improved. Our device can be worn under the clothes. It fits naturally with loose clothing and is always comfortable to wear in everyday life. Based on the collaborative research with the Samsung Medical Center, the increased walking speed and stride length are proven for the elderly. The improved walking balance and the reduced energy consumption are experimentally verified. So we're also working on a number of other disease conditions and innovations. Um, due to the time limitation, I will not go into those. So in summary, let's look at the opportunities and challenges, right? Um, I think build a context where non-invasive and passive monitoring is a, is a huge opportunity because it, this, these opportunities are unprecedented. And uh, our uh, healthcare partners are extremely excited because of the possibility, the way we can monitor these uh, signals and assess these signals uh, in a longitudinal manner, right? Understanding uh, the baseline, the progression or deterioration of certain condition. Um, and how we uh, innovate on not only detection, right, and monitoring, can we also provide subtle intervention techniques that is also passive, uh, non-intrusive, but yet very effective. Uh, and also develop personalized and privacy-preserving health sensing technologies. So these are the opportunities, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, we all know uh, the, the challenges are, are, are very uh, huge in realizing these opportunities. Um, for example, um, how we identify and extracting and even establishing new digital biomarkers, right? That takes a very long time in, uh, in conducting clinical studies. And, uh, and also we know tracking disease progression outside of clinical settings, the quality of data and, and uh, inference, you know, are really uh, affected by a lot of uncontrolled noises. And, uh, you know, also, you know, liking of ground truth or true positives, right? That's a, a challenge of conducting digital health innovation or machine learning uh, in, in this domain because we're not like in social media, right? The data is abundant. Um, in healthcare, there we have to comply with uh, the HIPAA uh, statute as well as, you know, if you're monitoring a bunch of healthy subjects, there never really a, an event, a true positive happen. If you don't have enough such data, you know, your research won't happen. And, and some other challenges, including, you know, how we preserve, you know, the safety, security, um, uh, you know, equally important privacy uh, in these non-controlled environment, both at home and on the go. And GDPR, right, we 
I think in California, we're going to uh, start the CCPA next year. Those are even making the digital health or health research in general uh, much more difficult. Um, but I think working together with cross industry as, as well as uh, you know, in between companies partnership, we will we'll be able to uh, overcome these uh, insurmountable challenges. So with that, I conclude my uh, presentation. And uh, so hopefully we can work together in vision and healthcare for anyone, anywhere, and any, at uh, any time. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, open up for questions. Uh, yes. Do you have a sense of what the price point is on the exoskeleton, the hip exoskeleton there? <laughs> uh, well, I think one thing, we, we're, we're not commercialized that product yet. Uh, so I'm not in the freedom to discuss a pricing point. But I think one thing for sure that Samsung is known as uh, the world's largest consumer electronics company, uh, we're, we're always able to either miniaturize or, uh, or leveraging the economic scale and producing the, the most economical, but also high quality solutions. For example, our VR headset is only uh, $99, right? Uh, I'm not suggesting our exoskeleton will be much, much cheaper than industry, but I believe it will be arguably most pricing, com you know, competitive across all solutions out there. Any other questions? No. I have a quick question for you in your digital health part. Are you taking it further to extend it so that then you share that data beyond, so now the data is collected by the person wearing the wearable? Then what, what step do you take that data and then share it to, with the providers, your doctors, better, so that you have better treatment? And then do you connect that with telemedicine? I see. So each of our project, you know, behind, a, it, we work with a, a clinical partner. So by definition, yeah, we are always uh, have a, a clinician in the loop uh, solution. So these are not just uh, as you know in the wild, uh, absolute self management. So we do take into consideration uh, how to feed that data back and help um, the health or healthcare delivery. Um, so the the second half of your question. In terms of telemedicine, are you taking that a step further to be able to communicate some of the information? Right, right, yeah. So so all these data are being collected almost like a near real time. And it depend upon uh, the clinical workflow, sometimes we intentionally not to feed that information to the uh, clinicians because they don't want to overwhelm themselves with a lot of data. But if it, the, these data are actually part of a clinical workflow in helping them to identify a certain condition or, or developing a treatment plan or uh, identify an opportunity for intervention, yes, then uh, by all means, these data are readily available and uh, uh, helped, uh, you know, the telehealth uh, element uh, for the solution. Hey, uh, Alex, what are the key skills the engineers on your team have? Are they mostly biomedical engineers, ECEs, yeah. programmers? Uh, so it's a multidisciplinary team. We start uh, the team, we have a user researchers and uh, UI UX design from um, information architecture to uh, HCI, like, uh, and then visual design, motion design, prototyper. We have a client engineer, cloud engineer. We also have a clinical researcher that conduct machine learning and make sure uh, all the biomarkers are clinically explainable from a you know, human anatomy point of view. Uh, and uh, every project we have our principal investigator uh, usually a world-renowned uh, physician in the specific domain, helping, guiding us in developing solutions. Um, and then we have uh, uh, technical program managers, uh, product managers. So, so as you can see, it's uh, about six or seven different um, skill set. Yes, one of my students actually spent uh, the summer uh, in your group uh, this last um, 
July. So yeah, so we even have uh, students from our department here that are joining. Yeah, some, yeah. Some we, we have a lot of so, double ECS, yes. you know, bio, bioengineering. Great. Let's uh, let's thank the speaker again. All right. Excellent. So um, you know, after our our keynote, we had uh, we had someone uh, from Caltech talking about some groundbreaking research in wearable sensing, and then we had this very different perspective from Samsung Digital Labs. And now we're going to have yet another uh, perspective, which is um, from a startup. So I'm I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Gina Ann Booth, who is the founder and uh, leader of Unali Wear. And she's going to be talking about uh, the Canego Watch. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear lots about it uh, in the next 30 minutes. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you here. And if I understand correctly, you were a graduate of our program from uh, a while back. Yes. So uh, welcome back to UT. Thank you. Let's uh, welcome the speaker. Let's try that again. There, that'll work better. Yep, got it. Okay, thank you guys so much for having me here. Um, as I said, my, or as, <laughs> as uh, Edison said, my name is Jean Ann Booth, and I am the CEO and founder of Unali Wear. So first what I want to do is tell you about where Unali Wear comes from, um, where our name comes from. Unali is Cherokee for friend, and Kanega, which is our watch brand, is Cherokee for speak. So we're the friend who speaks to you. I promised you that I was going to talk to you a little bit about the longevity economy and why it is that we do what we do at Unali Wear. And some of this information comes from a really important book called The Longevity Economy. This is from uh, Joseph Coughlin, who runs the MIT Age Lab. And he defines the longevity economy as the 50 plus. Okay, there's 110 million of us. Um, and the important thing about it is understanding that um, this population has almost $3 trillion in annual income. It's 48% of all the after-tax income in the United States. Okay, We are absolutely enormous. And the economic activity here, the opportunity, is enormous as well. 115 million folks above the age of 50 in just the United States. And what most people don't realize is that we dominate 119 of the 123 consumer packaged goods spending categories. It's a $7 billion online spending, a $7.6 trillion economic activity. Lots of money here. There's a lot of change going on in the longevity economy as well. So by 2030, one in five Americans is going to be 65 or older. Now, to give you some context on that, for those of us who were here in the 60s, back then in the United States, one in 11 was over the age of 65. And the amazing thing is that we are not going to be seeing just kind of a hump of the baby boomers. We are actually seeing a hump of old people pretty much everywhere worldwide. So it's not a matter of, you know, the baby boomers are going to get old and then they're going to die and then we're going to go back to 1 in 11. It's going to stay here for forever, or at least until some other really strange thing happens. Um, but. 
36% TAM growth um, just in the 65 plus demographic. And of course, everybody's heard, you know, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every day. But the other side of that is for all of the develop or all of the first world nations, we have a declining birth rate, which means a very much lower caregiver ratio. So usually every time I talk about the elder demographic, everybody wants to talk about caregivers. And if it's all about caregivers, we are in a world of hurt. Usually when we think about the elder demographic, this is kind of the cultural image that comes to mind, right? You got an old lady, she's probably got some mobility issues because she's got that cane, she's worried about money, she's depressed, she's lonely, life is really horrible. That is the cultural thought, right? <laughs> Thank God it's not reality. Here's the real reality of the human condition and why we have some challenges in dealing with the longevity economy. When you look at this guy, this is what you see. The truth of this guy, though, himself is, here's what he sees in the mirror. <laughs> For all of us who are older, you don't see yourself in the mirror. I look in the mirror, I see 30-year-old me. I rock. I'm not 30. <laughs> not even close. But you have to understand this if you're going to be building products for this demographic. Because we don't like old, we don't like ugly, we still have our pride. And if you're building products in this marketplace, you need to understand 64% of the U.S. wealth is us. Okay? And we're still active. We take trips, we eat out, we go to sports events, we go to concerts. And we have a lot of money. So when people kind of understand how big this marketplace is, and then they go to build products for it, they usually fail in a couple of different ways. The first one is so clear, poor design, poor aesthetics, because they're not usually as smart as Samsung in doing real user-centered design. We do the same thing, only a lot cheaper, because we're just a startup. But you've got to do that. And part of that is understanding the human emotional thing that says, if you give me something that makes me look old, I ain't using it. Okay? So the other part of it, and, and Joseph Coughlin talks about this a lot in his book, is, is that whole business of every time we think about an aging demographic, we immediately go to the sickest and frailest part of the population. So it's, it's like... People talk to me about our watch, and the first thing they go is, oh, my friend has Alzheimer's. Um, you know, or they're in a memory care community, or they're in skilled nursing. That's less than 2% of the 110 million people that we're talking about. We go immediately right there. That's not where we need solutions. We need solutions for us, the active, the independent, but maybe heading toward a little bit more frailty. At least that's my, <laughs> that's my version of the world. So I actually got here um, after my previous semiconductor companies sold to Texas Instruments and Apple. 30 years in semiconductors, yes, I'm a graduate of, of the University of Texas back in the day. Um, and my mom, who was a twin and a model, she's the, the one on the right side of the twins, um, my mom was turning 80. And mom was physically frail, but cognitively completely capable to the day she died which is an awesome way to be, as long as you can stay safe. So at the age of 80, when I was retired, I was a dive master on a liveaboard dive boat, and I had seen my mom, and she was getting kind of frail, a little bit unsteady, and I'm like, oh, got to do something. So I show up at her place with a spreadsheet. Here's all the products in the market. There's this pendant, this pendant, this pendant, this pendant, and this passive monitoring system. And my mom looked at me, and she goes, don't you get that from me? I'm not wearing it. And I'm like, okay, got it. <laughs> I don't know how you were with your parents, but you know, when you were a teenager and you know, your parents kind of gave you that look. I hadn't seen that look since I was a teenager. <laughs> and the problem was because the solutions that we have for an aging demographic are ugly. They're socially stigmatizing. And usually they're tethered to the home. So if you're active and frail, then there's nothing for you. So my mom was our senior user experience advisor. She was personally responsible for about the first 100 of the 400 folks who came through our focus groups as we were doing our original design. And it was the focus groups who first called us a wearable OnStar for people. 
because we provide discrete support for falls, medication reminders, and a guard against wandering with Guide Me Home assistance. We back that with artificial intelligence that learns the wearer's lifestyle, so kind of like a Nest thermostat except for, for people. Now, usually I don't talk about this part, but I'll talk about the technology, because you know, most of our wearers don't care, but you guys probably do. Inside the Kanega watch, we have cellular, Cat M1, Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth for hearing aids and telemedicine devices, a nine-axis accelerometer that is the first stage of automatic fall detection, and continuous speech recognition, because that is the interface to the watch. You talk to it, it talks to you. Now, the fundamental thing that made me come out of retirement was when I got together with some of my previous company founders and we were talking about what are we going to do for my mom because she said, don't get that for me, we came up with a patented battery system in the van, which means you never have to take your watch off to charge. And at that point, when I realized that we could keep my mom safe 24-7, I said, okay, I'm coming off the boat, we're going to do another company. And you simply take the, the battery off of the watch, put it on the charger, take one from the charger, and put it back on the band. There's one on each side, and that is the way that we can keep our population safe 24-7. Watch is waterproof, so you wear it all the time. And this is super important because for the elder part of our demographic, the number one cause of injury death is falls, majority of which happen in the bathroom, majority of which happen at night. So even if you're wearing a, a typical smartwatch, it's charging when our demographic is most vulnerable. Remember I said it's kind of all about people, um, and it's about the human part. We've had the technology capability to, to do solutions like this for a while, but what we haven't actually done is look at the people, understand that you see 30-year-old you in the mirror, and understand that the number one fear people have is, is losing control over their own lives. And yet, every time we talk about solutions for the elder demographic, the second word people say is caregiver. <laughs> First of all, there aren't enough caregivers. Um, and second of all, if you are cognitively capable but physically frail, the last thing you want is anybody telling you what to do, because you're not a kid anymore. And I don't know if you ever tried to tell an 80-year-old what to do. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. So, you also have to understand some other things, right? One-third of the 54 million people who are above the age of 65 walk their pets every day, especially their dogs every day, right? So you need something that's going to be moving outside of the house with them. And especially in the silent gen part, the older part of my demographic, they're not really good about taking their phones with them because they remember cell phones as the things that you turned on when you needed to make a call because they're really expensive. Remember that? So my mom had one, and every time we would try to, to, to get her to use it, she'd be like, well, I mean, it didn't turn it on. I don't need to call anybody. <laughs> that doesn't work. We're also voice first, and of course, you know, now, now everybody's like, oh, God, you guys are so smart. You're voice first. You talk to the watch, it talks to you, it's a, it's a growing marketplace. I started in 2013. Um, and, and it's really important because voice first is one of the ways that we can take a population that may not be technologically sophisticated and give them an interface to a sophisticated device as well, okay? And so that's what we do here, um, and that's what resu resulted in our, our recent award. Now, there's a demographic shift that's also going on here um, that most people don't realize. So it's not just that we've got all of these baby boomers, um, but also an understanding that especially among the younger baby boomers, so the, the decade, the, the bottom decade of the baby boomers, two-thirds of them, 16 million people, don't have children. Remember that whole caregiver discussion we were talking about? So usually in my demographic space, if you're buying a medical alert for somebody, the traditional buyer is me, right? That alpha female, the woman between the ages of 45 and 65, buying for the parents and the in-laws. Sorry, guys tend not to be the buyers unless there's no other choice. But if there's a woman anywhere around, she's the buyer. Is it not true? <laughs> it is true. So 
one of the things that's also changing here is that if two-thirds of the younger boomers don't have children, that means that they're never going to have the conversation that my mom and I had when she said, don't you get that for me. Because they're going to have their own conversation with themselves and go, 30-year-old me, after I break my wrist, well, maybe I do need something to keep me safe, and I'm going to make my own choice. And I'm not going to pick something ugly or stigmatizing, because after all, I'm only 30. So those focus groups and the work that we did in understanding not just what we could do with the technology, but what we could do to solve real human interaction and real emotional needs led to a design for what we call independence with dignity. Independence with dignity is our code word for the number one fear we have of growing old is losing control of our own lives. And so we give the control to the cognitively capable wearer back to the person who wears the Kanega watch. So we looked at the battery system already, but what I didn't tell you is that there's also a safety battery in the base that's not removable. So even if you manage to dislodge the battery pods that are in the band, we still have enough power to get a GPS fix and spend 15 minutes on the phone with the medical alarm operators that back our service. Remember, I did develop this for my mom, and it was kind of important to me that mom be safe. I talked about the speech interface. That's really important, being able to control it easily, because since we're all a bunch of nerds here, we think that everybody is like us. Guess what? <laughs> They're not. Thank God. Um, and so, so we have a tendency as digerati types to think that everybody else is digerati, and they're not. We are waterproof because, as I said, you have to be working in the bathroom, especially at night, if you're going to keep my folks safe. And then one of the other things is that we have a maximal contrast white on black display. So you see it right here, and in fact, you can see it because it's all about being able to see and visual acuity issues. So exactly what you were showing. My mom was one of the many, many folks above the age of 80 who had macular degeneration. And we were on about prototype five, maybe. And we had this super low power, very light black on gray, you know, the low power displays, the sharp memory and pixel display. It was great. And then mom goes, you know, I can't see that. And I'm like, well, mom, no, he didn't tell me you can't see that. And so thereupon, we did a whole bunch of work with light pipes and illuminating the front and illuminating the back, and none of it worked. And I went out and actually had to find a display manufacturer who would make me a custom round white on black display with the ability to flip to black on white depending on the type of visual acuity issues you have. So all of the manufacturing guys would come to me, the display guys, and they're like, oh, we've got this great colored display. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> because you need to be able to see it. And because of the human factors, it has to be non-stigmatizing. It needs to look like a traditional watch. And the number one comment I get when I'm on an airplane moving around, as I do, is, hey, is that the latest Apple Watch? Of course, my answer is, no, it's better than an Apple Watch. <laughs> because of the work that we do in keeping people safe, though, we do need to make sure that there's not a, only a speech interface to getting help, but also a button. Because you might have a cold, or worse, you might have had a stroke, and be unable to speak to your watch. So there's a crown button on the side of your watch. You guys know, look, we're all engineers. You don't need a crown button on a digital watch. But they don't know that. And that is the way that you can get help by pressing the button. You hold it for two seconds, and we call the operator for you. And that gives us the last piece, which is we are connected to medical alarm monitoring centers. So we're up and running in three of the largest medical alarm call centers in the United States. In the aggregate, they place about 400,000 new medical alerts a year. It's pretty much the, the oligopoly of the medical alarm monitoring um, industry. And that brings us to something super important because I promised I was going to talk to you about the FDA. <laughs> you just kind of hinted on the FDA, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the FDA. There are no physical biometrics on the Canega watch at all because of the FDA. And I'm in very much support of their mission, so, do, so don't, don't, uh, don't, don't get me in trouble here. Um, but 
Because we're connected to medical alarm call centers, they bypass 911 and go direct to dispatch. They have access to something called PSAP, the public safety access points, which means that they know where I am right now, and if my watch alarms, they know exactly what the status is of all of the emergency personnel anywhere around me. So if the nearest fire station is already on a call, they can go to the EMS station over here, okay? That's what PSAP connected um, centers are. That makes us class two emergency services. Emergency services is a special designation in class two, and what it means is that um, you can't add physical biometric sensors because at that point you're cutting the doctor out of the loop. So once you do that, then you become class three. Class three is about a $15 million nut, so it's $6 million to the FDA plus a minimum of 24 months of clinical trials. So we very carefully made sure that what we built in the Canega Watch would allow us to slide under the class two emergency services radar, and that's what we do. That's why, by the way, um, the Apple Watch goes to 911 because of the heart rate sensor. They, they can't connect to medical alarm call centers unless they go class three. So one of the other things that we didn't talk about in the, in the focus groups with, with our, our um, demographic is, is too much about the AI, except for one thing that I'll share with you. We actually describe our AI as learning the wearer's lifestyle. We take activity, location, and voice and use that to detect signs of increasing frailty or perhaps increasing depression or isolation, okay? Unlike Alexa, though, we don't listen all the time because, after all, the senior demographic is the privacy demographic, and they think that stuff is creepy. So I, I, so I was going to tell you one thing. So one thing that came up in the focus groups, which was really kind of funny, right? So this is what happens when you have nerds doing stuff. I had a focus group with a bunch of, of folks between the ages of 75 and 95, and usually I don't speak in the focus groups. I have a, a Myers-Briggs chameleon that, who, who actually does it for me because she can do it with no inflection whatsoever. Um, but if I have to speak because we didn't get the questions right, then I call that focus group burned because then they heard from me. So I had to burn one one of the times that we were actually talking about AI because I was trying to figure out how are we going to explain this without getting the creepy factor. And um, <laughs> we use the word pattern. So we learn your patterns, and when you break your pattern, then you know, your Canego watch is going to come to you and ask you if you need help or if you need directions home. And when you look at the video of that, it was the most amazing thing. Everybody pushed back from the table. Somebody actually stood up, and they all went, I don't have any patterns. <laughs> because in their minds, Pattern is a bad thing. It means you're boring, right? And so for those of you guys who are younger, it's a completely different world than what you live in because you've been hearing about your patterns all your life and everybody knows you have a pattern and it's just your unique pattern and mine is boring, but theirs is not. So we learn the wearer's lifestyle. So I hope that what I've talked to you about has helped you a little bit understand what we do, right? Why the opportunity is so big here, and why we did the design the way that we did with the human-centered principles, with the understanding of people's emotional background, not just what they said, to create products that actually delight wearers and give them safety and independence as they age. It's not just engineering. <laughs> now, you know she looks in the mirror and she sees 30-year-old her. These are the people that I want to keep safe. These are the ones that we actually work with. So I actually started UnaliWare to extend independence with dignity for my mom and also for your loved ones too. It is our hope to extend independence with dignity for millions of vulnerable people all over the world. And we do it by preserving dignity and giving control to the wearer. Fred Astaire, what time is it? The time is 12 p.m. It's time for me to go. Thank you.
All right. Uh, we have time for a question or two. <laughs> so I remember working with an executive who said, when you build user experience, make sure my grandmother can use it. It's easy as easy for my grandmother to use it. So in terms of when you were doing your focus group, what surprised you as you're doing it to make sure it's easy enough for that demographic to use the technology? What surprised me? Yeah, or any, any information you gathered that surprised you or that you input or you learned from as a result? You know, actually, there was one thing that, that I forgot to talk about, um, and, and that relates to part of why we do speech rather than anything else. Um, there's no touch interface on a Conega watch, and actually the, the other two wearable um, presentations talked a little bit about this, but they didn't take the step further. So the assumption, especially when I talk to venture capitalists, is, you know, Jean Ann, you don't have to worry about touch stuff because as the boomers get old, they grew up with technology and they're going to be just fine with touch. And the truth of the matter is, um, that's not true. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges you have as one of the challenges you have as you age is that chemical signal in the hypothalamus that says, I'm thirsty, quits to work. And then if you have any mobility challenges on top of that, then you're intentionally making yourself dehydrated on top of a body that wants to run dehydrated anyway, okay? So most often, um, especially frail seniors, actually are chronically dehydrated and so touch doesn't work for them. I actually saw this with my mom when I was teaching her how to use an iPad. And you know, she would, she would do this, she would touch, and then she'd just kind of fling her hand like, you know, I know it's not gonna work and I don't care. <laughs> But what was really happening is that she was dehydrated, and so touch didn't work. So I don't care how technologically sophisticated a boomer you might have been. When you're at that age, touch is probably not going to work for you. And you can see this if you travel a lot. You go to the airports, and, and you see the clear stations, right, to bypass TSA even. They have a, a special lotion there because... If you are chronically dehydrated, or if you are dehydrated when you get there, you don't have the galvanic skin response that powers touch, so you can't get through the clear station. So when you fail, they give you the little lotion, you put it on your hands, and then you pass, and off you go. That's exactly why they do that, and that's why we don't do touch on a Canega watch. Any other questions? I'm quite impressed by the speech interface. Uh, it, it seems like, especially with this population, uh, there would have to be quite a bit of um, you know, work on your part to, to make sure that it, it, it functions well for those who speak more slowly or those with some kind of condition. Can you speak a little bit about, about that and perhaps also the computational demands of something like this on a, on a watch? Sure, yeah. So, um so we're, we are really, really big users of user experience testers. Um, so uh, 2017, we came to market with our first watch. Um, let's see, not this one, but this one. It's kind of like being, you know, wah. Um, this is actually the 3G version of the watch. This is what's in market today. Um, we sold out of these. We have wearers across the US ranging in age from 16 to 100. So it's not all about seniors. It's just independent but vulnerable people. Um, and, and so when we did the first UX testing on this one, when we were ready to deploy, right, so not in the focus groups, but actually people wearing watches wherever they lived, um, we sent out a call and said, who wants to be a UX tester? And we were absolutely flooded with people who wanted to wear the watch for free and then give us their feedback. And so we ended up doing eight months of UX testing, during which time we changed a lot of stuff hardware, audio, the way the batteries worked in the old one. Um, gosh, so much stuff. There were three questions you had to answer. I speak English, I have Wi-Fi in the home, and um, I live in the United States. So everybody checked all of those little boxes, and then they gave us addresses from 33 different countries. 
So I think the need is pretty big. We actually still use user experience testing today. Um, in fact, we use it for everything we do. So before we rolled out medication reminders, we did a set of UX testers on medication reminders. And what we have today is actually just the first phase, and I wasn't going to roll it out, except for we had some Parkinson's folks in that UX group. And to a person, they came back to us after the UX time and said, I just had the best doctor's appointment that I've ever had since my Parkinson's diagnosis. And I attribute that to my Canega watch keeping me actually on track with my medications. So if you know anybody with Parkinson's, especially early stage, we've got some phenomenal drugs, but they're harder than any human can remember to take. They're just, it's an impossible medication regimen. Um, and so, if you can do that, though, the drugs are great. And so because of that, we went ahead and rolled it out, even at the first phase, which is not where we're going with that. So we are in UX right now on this one, which is the three I'm wearing. So champagne, rose gold, and black. Um, the uh, pre-sales are up on our website, unaliwear.com, order now. But the UX testers have already been identified. Some come from our 3G wearers, and some are completely new to the Canega watch. And we will keep doing that because it's really important because you can't, you can't be in somebody else's shoes no matter how hard you try. You need people to actually tell you really what happened. All right. Let's thank the speaker. All right. Yes, this was a very insightful view into what it takes to build a device like this for such an important uh, um, reason for such an important cause. Um, all right, so next we are going to have our panel on wearables and biosensing. And we need an extra chair. And I'll pass on to my co-organizer who's back, Nan Chu. Thanks, Edison. Very exciting morning session. So now our panel is standing between you and lunch. So I'll make sure we finish on time. So let me welcome our four panelists onto the stage. Scott Hansen, Kristen Schiff, um, Robert Hill, and uh, Bobby Curran. Please take a seat. All right, so um, thank you for staying. And uh, let's first start with uh, our um, a quick self-intro for each panelist, uh, who they are and what they do. Please. Robert. Hi, I'm Robert Hill. I'm a partner with Holland and Knight. I do complex intellectual property litigation and also a lot of intellectual property licensing and client counseling. Uh, and I'm part of our 5G initiative as well as our digital healthcare initiative. Hi, I'm Christine Sheevy. I'm the chief science officer at a company here in town called Nano. Um, we enable consumers, we're a health and wellness company that enables consumers to leverage their everyday information in real time at the molecular level. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Scott Hansen, CTO founder at Ambic Micro. We, uh, we build the microprocessors that go into the world's uh, longest lasting battery powered devices. So super low power chips, um, we have shipped somewhere north of 50 million chips. Uh, something like 40 million of those are in wearables today. So if you go out and, and go buy the biggest wearable brands in the world, there's a decent chance that our chip is inside of it. Uh, we're sitting right at the front edge of what's happening in wearables today and what will happen in the next five years, and, and are in many cases actively pushing that forward. Um, hello, I'm Bobby Curry, and I'm a practicing cardiac electrophysiologist uh, and cardiologist. Uh, I uh, also have co-founded uh, companies in the AFib space. Uh, AFib is the most common arrhythmia in the world, uh, and it's a problem that I deal with on a daily basis. And so one of the companies that I had started is called RFMX, and it's essentially uh, a digital ecosystem that we have created uh, using and leveraging uh, wearable devices. Uh, 
uh, with a patient-centered app that's integrated into healthcare systems that uh, identify patients who are at risk for strokes and to help uh, uh, leverage and, and uh, provide therapies for them, identify patients who are also at risk uh, in terms of uh, preventable uh, lifestyle risk factors. Um, a lot of uh, variables in atrial fibrillation can be prevented uh, and outcomes significantly improved if you uh, address some basic risk factors. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, allowed uh, this technology, this ecosystem, as I like to call it, to connect the patient, physicians, and healthcare providers and actually be integrated into a healthcare system uh, that can be uh, utilized in a practical way uh, to improve clinical outcomes. Well, thank you um, for joining me today on this wearable panel. So we are going to first uh, discuss uh, several um, points here, and then we are going to open the floor for the audience to ask questions to our panelists. So the first question is for every panelist. So if we um, take a look at the talks this morning and then how wearables are progressing, so we can see that generation one are mostly smartwatches tracking activity, and uh, now Apple Watch and Unali Wear are trying to get into the um, health and medical space. So if you are allowed to daydream, what is your vision for wearables in the next five, 10, 20 years? Um, how about um, um, Robert? So Scott? One of the things that I would say is I think that we're, we will probably see more and more uh, products that also have an intervention component, especially as you go further out and whether it's just an interactive piece or, or maybe something even further. Uh, especially as, as wearables push more into medical grade implantables and other things. And I think that one of the interesting things to see will be the race between um, artificial intelligence machine learning that's locally hosted versus things that are partially integrated with a network or there may even be a, a human brain in, as part of it where, oh, the sensors say that an event is happening right now, maybe there's a device on you that can do something about it in addition to the important alerting uh, function. Thanks. And I agree with you on the intervention piece. I also think that, um, you know, as sensors progress, we'll be digging deeper into the molecular level of resolution, mm -hmm. um, both um, regarding our own biomarkers, but also um, markers from our environment, so chemical triggers every day that impact our health. Yeah. Scott? Thanks. Uh, so I think they basically hit on this, but I think today uh, healthcare is very much reactive. It's not proactive. I think if we can if we can make wearables a little bit more intelligent, uh, we can start to anticipate potential problems. And and I guess speaking technologically, uh, the neural network, deep neural network, is a fantastic tool that's emerged in the last five years or so uh, to start addressing some of these problems. And we have this problem today that that these things are not computationally heavy duty. Uh, I think uh, Gene Ann's talk was interesting. We saw voice get embedded in these uh, devices. I think we're gonna go 10 steps further and we're gonna see heavy duty neural networks start to analyze the mounds of data that are coming out of these devices. And hopefully that allows us to be more proactive than reactive in terms of responding to, to health problems. Uh, Heart disease is a whole lot. I'm, you know, I'm sorry to venture into your area. This is really bad. But uh, heart disease is a whole lot. Yeah, it's a whole lot more problematic if we're addressing a known illness versus versus getting out in front of it. Um, I mean, today my uh, my Garmin watch is tracking my VO2 max number, and just since using it, my VO2 max has gone up by a couple of points, and my heart health has gotten dramatically better. Uh, I can see if I extrapolate out, I can see a whole bunch of interesting stuff that could you know, happen beyond that. And that's where low power computing is right. so important. Very good. No, I, I'm, a, I'm really excited and, um, you know, I'm like a, a kid in a candy store sitting here as a physician listening to all the technologies being developed. And, uh, and, and so the future, you know, uh, it's not too much of a daydream. Uh, the reality is, is that wearable devices are out there and they provide us with very useful information for us to make decisions on. And so one of the big changes that we will see is that um, care, healthcare really is episodic. You go to the doctor, you see your physician maybe once every six months or maybe it's once a year. Uh, but really within that time interval, we get a static uh, data point of your blood pressure, your heart rate, maybe spend 10 minutes with the patient. Um, whereas uh, now, with wearable devices, we can actually move from an episodic model to a continuous monitoring 
uh, model. And, and what this allows us, particularly with the technologists out there, is uh, to remotely monitor patients. And so one of the things that I do as an electrophysiologist is I put devices in people. I put pacemakers to help with their heart rate, defibrillators, um, chronic recent synchronization therapy. We also put implantable loop recorders. And we already utilize remote monitoring in this specific patient population. And what we found is that, number one, they don't come, they don't have to see us in the clinic as much because we see them remotely. So that saves them the energy of actually having to come to the physician and so forth. And for a lot of elderly patients, that's that's a good thing. Uh, two, what, even though we don't physically see the patients uh, as much, we see them once a year versus every three months because they have an implantable device that we uh, monitor remotely, um, their outcomes are better. And so, you know, that's a very specific niche group that the data is already defined. So now we're moving in an era where wearable devices can be monitored just like these cardiac, intracardiac devices are. And so the bet is, particularly with patients with chronic diseases, is that we will um, also have similar findings in terms of monitoring these patients. Well, they'll actually physically not have to come to the physician as much, but we're actually gonna get more meaningful data. So that's, you know, that's, that's the daydream, but that's also the reality of, of saying, okay, we can then have these structures with these neural networks that identify patterns and so forth and uh, triages patients accordingly. And so instead of waiting six months when you, you know, in heart failure, uh, we figured it out within a week or two. So. It's always exciting to see medical doctors buying to the wearable technology and industry, um, but we are also experiencing a lot of barriers, especially from the patient side, like patient compliance and the willingness to uh, cooperate. So let's start from um, Bobby again. So what are the current barriers you see that um, prevent us being there already? Uh, so one, I'm probably uh, a barrier or what I represent. So the medical community in general is as slow to uptake new technology and rightfully slow. We need to vet these things and make sure that there's a value that's given anytime a new technology is, is uh, um, put out there for patients to use. Um, but, you know, for sure, the medical community can be slow in uptaking new technologies. Two, um, we live in a fee-for-service model of healthcare. So every time a patient shows up, I get paid. Right, um, and prevention is really not how most physicians are reimbursed. And so, uh, as a interventionist, I do procedures. I get paid per intervention. So that's I'm not saying that's what I do, you know, intentionally, <laughs> but but that's how the model's incentivized. And so, you know, so the model itself, going a fee for service to a value based model, you know, would push that further. And we're slowly moving in that direction uh, as well. The third thing from a barrier, practically speaking, is just the data. Um, the amount of data from all these devices, I mean, I've seen the uptake in the last couple of years where patients will bring me their Fitbit, they'll bring me their Apple Watch data, they'll want me to review their trends. It's not really integrated into the healthcare system yet, and so that's one of the problems that we're hoping to solve. Uh, but, but those are the, the practical barriers, at least from a clinical perspective that, that I see. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so I, my answer is going to be a bit self-serving, but uh, one of the, we, we build incredibly low power compute. I said earlier that I think uh, deep neural networks in particular are a fantastic tool for taking all of this data that, that is available, crunching those numbers and, and pulling something out of it. Uh, and there's two big problems I see. One of those is one we're, we're directly solving, which is uh, it's just very hard when I've got a little wrist-worn device or I've got something embedded in my clothing to do a lot of compute uh, on a tiny little battery. Uh, and I mean, if you look at uh, like our chip today that is inside this watch uh, is probably on par with, say, a Pentium processor from the early 1990s, okay, which is, which is incredible. And we run in microwatts of power. It's, it's a really incredible thing. But we need something vastly in excess of that to take the mounds of data that this is producing in any given second and, and do some reasonable analysis in the form of a, of a neural network. So good news is we're solving that problem. Moore's law is alive and well, uh, certainly for embedded computing like this. And so we can expect to see uh, chips get faster and faster, get uh, more energy efficient. We're certainly leading the charge on that. But there's this other question, or this, uh, this other challenge that you come across. Once you've got a chip that's capable of running neural networks and, and doing interesting analysis, the problem is you need something to run on it, right? I mean, you, 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 uh, we don't have neural networks that are, that are built to assess the, the sets of data that we have today. Uh, we lack data itself. That's probably the more fundamental problem is we lack data to actually go train these things. So yes, these, these 
wearables are producing all kinds of raw data, but it's not labeled data. It's not the kind of data that we can use to, to train a neural network. So I think we have a long way to go on the, on the uh, uh, neural network side and on the data side to really get there. Um, the good news is the, the chips are basically here, okay? I mean, this is a solved problem. I think we're probably several years ahead of, of where the data analysis community is on this. So <laughs> please catch up to us. We're, we're basically ready to go. Great. So on the one hand, we have a, a lot of data um, and uh, not even connected. But on the other hand, uh, we are still lacking the ground truth, like uh, uh, Alex mentioned. So Christian? So along those lines, I agree. There are mounds and mounds of data that we know are relevant and we know we can collect and there are limitations in collecting them. Um, but, you know, the biological system is a very complex one and it's a matter of, you know, today, as all of this is progressing, understanding what matters, what data matters, what should we be collecting, and enabling consumers tools that allow them to collect this data comprehensively so that we can enable better treatment, ultimately. So I think that's very important, and right now there's a lot of real-time data coming in, and more emphasis should be placed on which data streams collectively mean the most. So, so from my perspective, I think that the technologies that we're talking about today and a lot of the wonderful research that's happening both within the academy and out in the private sector are going to determine what can happen. But I think to a very large extent, it's going to be legal, regulatory framework and compensatory frameworks that determine what will happen. And so I talk a lot with friends who, for example, are chief technology officers of major hospital systems, the kinds of uh, end users that really drive some of the, the economics of these things. And they tell me that they sometimes get frustrated because they love the technologies and they see the benefits of them. But in some cases, there's barriers to compensation, whether it's an insurance matter or other sort of regulatory risks, including one of the issues that comes up a great deal is um, in a lot of places, telemedicine will be compensated at a different pay scale or, or not at all in some cases. Um, and so there's a, a practicality that sometimes becomes very frustrating for people who see the value of what the kinds of folks in this room are doing, um, but don't have a way to bring it to the market in a, a very effective way. So I, I think that one of the things that will be important is finding the right regulatory frameworks that balance the kind of security, the, the HIPAA rules and other things that we need um, at the same time without stifling innovation. And one thing I'll, I'll just say very briefly is when you really start going into the weeds on some of these issues, particularly big data monetization as it relates to um, uh, biotech, pharma, all kinds of applications, is it turns out there's a lot of state-based rules in terms of wh who owns what medical information. Um, and it becomes a very complex question. And so then you have balances uh, related to federal preemption and other things. Do we make it a uniform situation or do we want there to be different laboratories for experimentation? And so hopefully we'll collectively strike a good balance that allows all these wonderful technologies to thrive as they should. Thank you, wonderful. So um, when we uh, talk about the data, right, um, the question is how do we really convert the data to value to serve our patients and our population and our uh, elderly generation? So um, what are your thoughts about uh, converting the data ultimately to deliver the value? Um. So just very briefly, I'll say, um, and this has already been, I think, on this panel some, uh, many of my friends who work in commercial applications of AI and machine learning will say that, that for many problems, they feel that the framework that they have has kind of outstripped the quality of the training sets they need for their deep neural networks and such things. And, and they tell me that with a proper set of information, especially of a a sufficiently high quality and with the proper markings and other things, they think that they're ready to go, um, but, they, but they need to be fed. And I would say that all of this data is most powerful when collected, again, as I said before, in a comprehensive format, but also at the same level of resolution. So there's episodic data coming in, there's real-time data coming in. Some of it's at the molecular level, some of it would be something like a social determinant. And to take all of that data and to think about it in a way where it's most actionable. Okay, so I'll go someplace maybe slightly controversial. I think, I think we need to give the data to people who know 
how to do things with the data. So um, if anybody was reading the Wall Street Journal today, there's a good article about Google and Ascension uh, working together on uh, health records, and, and Google would give one central rep repository for the data. So there's all kinds of ethical things that we don't need to go into here uh, that relate to that. But these are the, pe the same people, these are the most sophisticated uh, machine learning experts in the entire world. We're giving them this, all this data. They could, in theory, do something very good with it. I'm not sure that we'll, we'll arrive there. Uh, there's all sorts of you know, ethical concerns, as I said, but I think that's great. If we can find a way to do it ethically, if we can find a way to, to keep it focused on, on analyzing data in a way that, that adds value, I'm actually very in favor of giving data to people like Google. Um, but again, I want to be very careful. I'm, I'm acknowledging ethical concerns there. Sure. Um, just to repeat the question, how do we provide value? Right. Um, so um, I, I'm a little biased, but you know, watching uh, Gene and Booth's talk, um, you know, I, I love that because that's how you provide value. And, and, and I say that specifically, not, she's not paying me for her watch or anything, but to market, <laughs> to advertise, but I say in, in, that, in that methodology and approach in terms of um, saying, okay, there is a problem. So it's problem-based uh, learning and value creation. So here's the problem, her mother, had an issue with falls and she's frail. Okay, how do I solve the problem? What tools are out there that I can integrate to create a better reality? Um, and so I think that is the key to value creation. Uh, there's, at the end of the day, it came from her own empathy for her mother, uh, her own skill set to be able to say, you know what? There's something better out there. I'm gonna create it because this person deserves it. So empathy and dignity. So that's how you create value. So when you, when you keep things patient-centered uh, and you use those two elements, um, the rest of it will fall into place. You know, uh, and that's a little naive to say it, that generally, but there's some truth to that in the sense that if you have, the tools are all out there. I mean, Moore's Law, as we, we know, it's rapidly evolving in, in, in terms of how this technology is turning over. But for us to actually find value with all the technologies out there, we have to start with saying, okay, well, what is the problem and why do I want to solve it? Well, I want to solve it because that person deserves something better. And there's no greater powerful motivator to solving a problem than that. Wonderful. Okay, so we have a few minutes left and you have all heard uh, different, very different perspectives and constructive discussions from our panelists. So it's your opportunity to ask uh, any questions to any panelist or all of them. Anyone? Yeah. Um, So to answer the first part, no, there is not time specifically set aside to look at it, and that's an extra data piece that's inefficiently brought into a very tight time interval. Um, uh, but there are mechanisms um, once a structure is constructed that allows us to consume that data in a meaningful and productive way. And so a good example, it goes back to, um, as an electrophysiologist, since I put in devices, and we track patients that have implantable devices, I see that patient once they agree to do remote monitoring once a year. And so now I can consume that data in a way, and there's a structure that's already created that's billable, so I'm incentivized to review the remote monitoring data and track it and comment on and read it uh, on a monthly or every three month basis uh, that allows me to use that data you know, moving forward. So jump forward to where we're at today with wearable devices, um, I give uh, CMS credit because they are now producing billing codes that allow us to use biometric data uh, and bill for it, right? And so now part of what we are doing is creating that construct and structure just like I have with implantable cardiac devices and replicating that in the wearable world. We can take all that data, create a separate structure that's not really a part of the clinic visit per se, but I can bill off of that structure 
and then you know act on it you know to oh, okay this patient there's a change in their weight oh well, I don't have to act on it but we can create a structure and systems for nurses or nurse practitioners to respond to that and if they need to if it's bad enough they can be brought in to see me uh, uh, in the clinic and so forth and so that so, so, so no we don't have time to have data brought to us in a uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, in a way that's not very organized, but there are definitely ways and there will be ways uh, for that wearable data to be organized and integrated into the healthcare system in a meaningful way that will improve outcomes. Well, I, I'd bet they improve outcomes. Wonderful question. Any other question or suggestion, comments? Uh, if you could comment on uh privacy-preserving uh, approaches that you take in, for preserving the patient's data before sharing with uh, companies to, to apply their machine learning, et cetera, uh, any analytics? Uh, uh, Maybe Robert, uh, from the legal perspective? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess what I'll say is this. There's a complex set of rules under HIPAA and other things, more and more sets of overlapping statutory authorities, and that's even just within the United States, about what you can and can't do. And it, when we work with clients who are working on monetizing data, it's typically a, a complex case-by-case -case situation to figure out what rules <clears throat> are, are being covered by them, what uh, physical security measures are they taking as well as like what encryption and all these things to make sure that they're both covered on a on a legal perspective but also from a from a technical perspective and the answer and the answer varies and one of the challenges for this is some of the kinds of information that you might want to anonymize if you anonymize it that might kill the value of the data set in an important way um, so I'll give the standard lawyer answer. It depends, but it really, it really does depend. And the other thing I would just say is that it's also a situation where sometimes the rules are somewhat counterintuitive and people who think that they're not being covered, for example, by HIPAA are because they're a business associate. And then sometimes there are folks who are doing things that feel very sort of medical, but for one reason or another, it turns out that they're not covered by that regime, but they might be covered by other regimes. Um, so it, it, it really varies, it depends a lot, um, and it's something that everybody's got to think about if they, their business touches on this in any way. Very well. So our panelists will be around uh, for lunch, so if you have for future questions, you are welcome to just chat with them privately. Uh, with that, let's have a round of applause to thank our four wonderful panelists again. And thank you also for um, being patient with us. And lunch is right outside. Thank you so much. Oh,